you for donating or not donating, but being a volunteer, volunteering your time. Uh, I guess the early bird gets the worm, and I get I guess the, I get the first question on the floor. Uh, my school district handed over a brand new curriculum, uh, the teacher's guide and the workbook with no instructions, and they gave it to me. So when I uh, I I was reading through it, I figured out I couldn't do it on my own. I called the school. They set up a 45 minute meeting and. Be happy to jump in. Um, your child has a has an IEP currently for direct live instruction in a brick and mortar building. Yes. Okay. Then the uh, the plan that you've been given does not match that. Your first step of action is to document in writing to the special ed director and the case manager, and I would copy your local department of education your state department of education. And I would say that the IEP that I have um, right now and attach a copy of it cannot be implemented with the learning plan uh, that you have hoisted onto me. Uh, the IEP that you've given me calls for certified special education instruction in a particular setting with these supports and services. I have none of that. We'd like, I'd like to have an IP meeting. Here are three dates and times I'm available. All the mandatory members need to be there as well as, as an assistive technology specialist because my child may need additional assistive technology. And we will need to come up with a, you know, an interim IEP. Um, and I will need a certain amount of direct instruction because the way the goals are written, um, me not being a certified teacher there's no way I can implement the IEP. Uh, now, one thing I do want to point out, and that's what you'll put in your letter, and then you'll wait 48 hours to get a response. If you don't have a response, and you'll follow up again, and after that, you'll elevate it to the superintendent. The big thing I want to emphasize here is that when ch with children who have significant uh, needs, one-on-one -on -one instruction will be required, even if it is virtual and live streaming. And it cannot take place. We don't take an IEP that called for six hours of direct instruction at your traditional school and attempt to implement the same IEP for mm -hmm. an appointment every day. It doesn't happen that way. You'll have to go to bat and get an IEP meeting um, and get people to change that. And they will, it, it, likely it will, there will be an attempt to water it down, not because people don't care about your child, but because there's not adequate staffing for every mm -hmm. teacher to do this with their students. Um, but the squeaky wheel and the early wheel will get the grease. So after day 10, they are required to go ahead and um, call an IEP meeting and really give you what you need to get through this full closure period. Does that make sense to you? Thank you. And I attended your uh, presentation here in Augusta. No, oh, great. Thank you so much. Yes, you looked familiar. Good to see you here. Likewise. Thank you, everybody. We, we, Regular folks, we appreciate all this. Thank you so much. I You're hope you feel better. Thank you. Likewise, Tina. Uh, Thank you. you. Real quick note, guys, administratively, make sure if you have uh, cell phones or anything else that you turn the ringers off and that you turn the things off, um, that
Brenda, it's not up. Hang on one second. Let me see if I can get it up there. I'm, I'm their presenter and I'm nervous for you guys. I don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Next slide. Can you put the next one? Oh, there we go. All right. Thank you. Oh. Sorry, guys, the, the the connection, I don't know what's going on with connection, but it, mine keeps going in and out, in and out, in and out, so just bear, <laughs> just bear with me. You're, you're a couple slides ahead. Okay, go back. Okay, thank you. Okay. You're welcome. Sorry. <laughs> oh, no worries. Uh, so my name is Tanya Schlegel. I'm a special education advocate. Uh, I serve the Augusta, Georgia area, and that includes a little bit of South Carolina. Um, I am a mom of two great kids who both have unique educational needs. Um, they are alike in some ways and, and different in others. So we, uh, uh, between the list of disabilities that we cover most of them in our house. Uh, so I became an advocate when I couldn't find resources for myself and I learned very quickly that I had to figure things out on my own and educate myself. Uh, so I started with Rights Law Conferences and later joined COPA as a member and um, now as a trained advocate. Um, so due to some health reasons, I'm stepping back for a little while. So I reached out into my network and I asked, you know, for a little bit of help. And so I'm very thankful for that. Um, I do currently serve on the Georgia Department of Education State Advisory Panel. Our objective is to help meet the unmet needs of special education <laughs> students here in Georgia. Visit understood.org and check out all the resources there. Um, I was also a former consultant for the National Centers for Learning Disabilities. Unfortunately, with both of those nonprofit organizations, um, funding was an issue and we weren't able to continue those programs. Um, but I you know, moved on to advocacy since then. Um, so I do have a few pieces of advice um, for parents um, that are, no matter where you are in the journey, definitely learn as much as you can. Follow you know, advocates and attorneys, go to as many conferences as you possibly can, whether they be web-based, live, <coughs> Um, join COPA either at, either at the parent level um, or the advocate level and when you get stuck definitely reach out for help every penny that you give to a qualified advocate is really saving you a lot of time and you know and time and services that your child can never get back um, so again I want to thank everybody for participating tonight um, everybody that you know catches this live or on the replay it's going to be fantastic, and I really appreciate everybody being here. Thank you. Brenda. Okay. Brenda, can you ask people to mute themselves? Yes, so I will. Thank you. Yes. Can anybody who's on here make sure that you guys are muting your sound? There's a lot of background noise going on and text messages that are going through. So as an administrative note, please make sure that when a speaker is speaking, that all of your sounds are off. If you have to leave, that's fine to go into the other room. Just make sure that you turn your microphone off so it's not interrupting when people are talking. Okay, Melissa, next slide. All right, so just a real quick rerun of what we visited before. Um, we're going to be hearing from quite a few presenters tonight. We were very lucky to get a, a variety of different people who are available to work with us. In 
in the meeting, we're going to be speaking about different things that might affect you when you're working at home with your child, some resources that you need to know. And our presenters are Tanya Schlegel, myself, um, Tammy Carpenter, and Julie Cunningham. We're going to have uh, Marcy Melzer, Naomi Williams. We're going to have Jenny Young, Christy Kovas. We're going to have Carol Taylor, Shelby DePilla, Kelly Cadden, Diane. Cessna, and then we'll have hopefully enough time to have questions and answers and go over resources. And if I butchered any of your names, I am so sorry. Um, but we're going to go over some of these things and try to hold off questions until the end, just because we have so many people to get through. If we do have time, we will stop and take a minute to answer a question here and there if, if a presenter ends early or if, we're, if we find out that we're running sooner. Again, make sure your cell phones, all the noises are off. Um, and at this time, we're going to go ahead and have Tammy. Naomi, are you going to go first or Tammy? Can you all oh. hear me? <clears throat> yes, I can hear you now. Okay, I was going to say if Naomi wants to go first, because we're trying to give Julianne a chance to get in. She's having to okay. do something with a little boy, so if she wants to go first, that's great. Tammy, you can go first. I think Julie had to step away for just a minute or two. Yep, that's yeah, that's why I asked. She texted me. <clears throat> Julie just texted me. She's going to try to make it here in just a few minutes. If you wanted to go before me, Tammy and Julie, I believe, are presenting together as a team. Yes. Yes. So we want to put, go ahead and let Marcy go. Yeah, we can start there. That's fine. Marcy, is that okay with you? So you'll have to scroll through a couple slides. Can you hear me okay? There yeah. I am. So hi everybody who's joining. Um, I am, my name's Marcy and I am a speech and language pathologist and I have an online platform called Waves of Communication where I teach parents how to facilitate speech and language at home and the platform exists. I used to do speech therapy in brick and mortar places and it turned out that um, consulting services have been beneficial for parents who are needing to facilitate language in their homes. So it supplements what they get at school and really helps them solidify the speech and language that's going on in their home. And my specialty is helping parents shift their children from nonverbal communication systems, whatever they're using, if it's behavior, if it's pecs, if it's, you know, any kind of nonverbal system into spoken language. That's what I help parents do is in a developmental language model. And so I have a wide variety of resources for parents that are available right now. I have a YouTube channel with 250 videos. I wrote a book um, and I have an online course that's on sale right now. And it's all, you can access them on my website, wavesofcommunication.com. And what I've decided to offer today on this little conference is my five favorite tips that I am offering to the people who follow me on my platform who are finding themselves suddenly in a position where the speech therapy services are unclear. Um, you, you know, you're not sure, you're, you know, if you are having support of a therapist that, you know, you're getting as part of your IEP services, how to best use those things now. So um, here are the five tips. Number one is to understand your family's current functional communication system whatever is working right now they're in your house so there are probably are systems that are in training and process at school sometimes you might be using your child might be using them in both places and 
You want to do your best to accommodate your child to be comfortable using whatever they like. If they like using pictures, then facilitate that at home. If they are avoiding pictures, if they're not, you know, if they're, if that's something that they're still in the early stages of trying to train, using it functionally at home without support from therapists could mess up the whole process. So parents should use the resources that you feel confident using, and I recommend following your child's lead as far as communication. So if they're doing a lot of behavior to communicate, which most nonverbal kids use primarily at home, they point to things or get things independently, I recommend that parents right now do a lot of verbalizing out loud, just like when your kids were real little the thing say out loud the messages that they are non-verbally communicating and so they know then that you are understanding them and that will help you avoid a lot of misunderstanding related behavior frustration related behavior in the process and talk through I know that there's other folks going to be talking today about talking through the process of what's going on right now, using the language for really what's happening, being real with your kids and explaining things in a way that they can understand. Okay, number two is avoid prompting your kids to say words. If they are limited verbal and you're working on trying to expand language, your speech therapy trying whatever time should be separated from your everyday life. Because if you are all day, every day, prompting your child to say words every time they want something, and now we know the kids are wanting to eat every 30 seconds, so every 30 seconds when they want something, Something to eat you're prompting them to stop make them try to use their sign or their pecs or their words to say those things that's gonna make your day really really long you'll be better off facilitating requesting by honoring your child's nonverbal requests using whatever they're using and facilitating talking about the language that they will need and if they can't get it then you work with that too but it doesn't mean that you give in everything your child wants. If they can't have it, they can't have it. The point is no more holding back and waiting until a child gives you a sign or a picture or something like that. Because if you don't know when to turn that off, it can increase the anxiety and undo a lot of teaching that you're doing. All right, number three. Talk slowly and carefully using language that is attractive to your child. This is the strategy that every teacher and therapist and, you know, ABA person um, who wants to engage with kids, that's what they do to get them to listen and pay attention to them. They talk a little differently. They get a little bit more animated and attractive to their kids. So even if you're just telling your kid it's time to get up and get dressed or now we're gonna go and have a little school time or let's go outside and have a walk it needs to be a little bit more energy behind that because kids are used to seeing that in their teachers and the everyday stuff from mom you'll get a little bit more um, engagement and listening if you can be like their characters so if your child really likes to listen to a certain character on video Videos, if you talk a little bit like those characters using the same phrases and changing your voice up sometimes that's going to increase your child's interest in listening to you and this is what we want to facilitate above all is because you're in charge you're setting the the pace for your child and if you can facilitate them to listen and follow you through the day as you guide them step by step or set up your schedule whatever you're encouraging them to do facilitating them to be good listeners and attentive listeners will help you in the long run okay and then the last um the fourth strategy that i have the tip is to use functional everyday activities not just the things that you know you do like you know everyday things like laundry and those things are everyday functional activities but i'm talking about 
every day, like every day you brush your teeth, every day you clean up toys, every day you take a bath, those things that you do every day, if you dial in the language and structure and sort of step-by-step -step process and flow of those every single day activities, it will help you keep some structure and flow in your language models for your child so that they will start to learn some of the repetitive activities that they get from school because that's how teachers get kids through a day. Remember all those visual schedules we make and stuff. This is how you're going to help your child using every single day they know those things are coming and it helps provide comfort and you also have a little bit more control over you know what happens when and then my last tip for everybody is the title of my book it's called if it isn't fun it isn't fun and that is true about everything in life and it certainly is true about language learning if um, anyone is forced to learn words that someone else wants them to say they're not going to be as interested as learning the words that they want to learn so I am encouraging parents to take advantage of what I am calling an unprecedented opportunity I know it's not what we're used to and I know these resources have gone away at least temporarily and the folks on this on this um, the whole process today this whole program today are going to talk to you about advocating to make sure that you get the support you need but I know in the meantime and in between your advocacy calls there's things that you need to support you to get through the little fires that you have in your day and the resources on my platform are designed to help you with that so I just want to thank everybody for a allowing me to join you. I'm from Florida, by the way, but I work with parents all over the world in my language facilitation coaching programs, and I am providing parents with a temporary homeschool plan that they can use even long term that will mesh with whatever recommendations come from their speech therapists or teachers to help them work into facilitating language through everyday activities and that's what I do on my platform so thanks again for allowing me to come and best of luck to everybody you got this you parents are wonderful language facilitators and there are resources all over now with this kind Kind of community to get you going so i'm sending everybody lots of good vibes and and energy i know you can do it thank you marcy for presenting if you had to tell parents one positive thing that they could do to lift their self-esteem up and get them through this crisis what would it be so the parents that i have been working with are um, you know coming on my platform with a lot of fear right now because they have you know given up the responsibility of teaching their kids to someone else and the positive thing I want to tell you is that parents all over the world are proving that they can teach their kids to talk during these functional activities and that I know with this extra time you have if you were gonna work on something and you really want Wanted to get your kid to being vocal to using unprompted spoken language and you could have this two weeks to two months time or however long we're gonna have and double down and focus on teaching your child spoken language you could send them back to school with more spoken language that will help them be successful in all of the rest of the things that they'll do and you have the capability to do this now no matter what is going on to cause your child's late talking so, you know, I encourage you to look at this as an opportunity and take on the challenge and the responsibility because I know you can do it because parents all over the world are. So you can, you can, you can look at it from a positive. Thanks, Marcy. Is there anyone who has any questions for us? We have a few minutes uh, before uh, Tammy and Julie are going to speak. We're running a little bit ahead of time. So is there anyone that has a question right now for Marcy or for Tanya? And sure. Julie's back, by the way, so we can do them next. I had a quick question for Marcy. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, go ahead. Awesome. Uh, so my children um, had speech delays, 
they both have auditory processing disorder. Um, so my son is 11 and my daughter is 13. And my son also has articulation errors, R, L, and T, H. Um, on your platform, do you have resources for this or is there something that you could recommend? No, what I do is for no matter what is causing the, what I call late talking, because it, if in a developmental model, the kids are developing processes and sometimes they develop them in a wrong way, which is where these articulation differences come from, the phonological processes and things like that. And then in the in the skewed way of development, then they become habitual. So they become the habit way of talking using these articulation errors. And habits are unconscious. Kids aren't aware necessarily that they're even doing it. It bothers everyone else more than it does bother the child to have these articulation issues because everyone else, and that's a, you know something that every single parent is, I don't wanna say guilty of, but happens by necessity. You fill in the blanks for your kids when they don't understand everything you make sure if they don't get it completely you give them a visual model or a hand over hand or you give them that demonstrate and then kids get comfortable especially teenagers in that well it works for me now so why should I even be motivated to improve my articulation? You mean R and L and TH, you obviously know they've been on an IEP for probably a really long time and they're just the last ones that are getting cleaned up. But a teenager to work on articulation is going to take forever because they're just going to go to school, to the therapy and practice and they're going to get really good. But if you're not seeing any improvement at home, things like what I teach parents how to do is get kids motivated to improve their articulation to especially with an auditory processing disorder self listen self gauge his own and instead of other people judging him yes that's correct no that's not he has to be motivated to want to improve so without that mindset of I need to use better talking myself you might as well not even waste your time on speech therapy because it's just repeated drill without any long-term need. Kids, when they first start, they're highly motivated to start talking because they don't have any way to communicate their needs. Once kids get to the point where they can get their needs met because parents go ahead and take over the rest of the responsibility, that's when you get stuck. So my platform is actually what you need instead of speech therapy to show you the strategies that I would recommend to use functional speech and language facilitation to get those, get your kids to highly, because they know how they've been taught how to make the TH sound. They're teenagers. They've had it for a long time. A lot of times the therapist has modeled it and showed them how to do it, but for one reason they're stuck and it's not sticking with them, they're not getting it. And it's not because it's not their auditory processing, it's because of their habits. So it's not necessarily about learning new skills. It's about deciding you want to. And that's what my platform teaches parents how to do. Does that make sense? It does. He was actually denied speech therapy. Um, but that's Because a, they don't make progress. Because how right. are you going to, I mean, they don't, you know, you can do it over and over and over again. And by the time you're 11 years old, because that's why speech therapy quit on that on those kids because they can't document progress the kids don't make gains because it isolated drill work in articulation it's like sending a child to play piano lessons and never if they hate it and then you know making them play songs and making them go and do and expecting them to want to go to Juilliard someday and they hate it <laughs> well, thank you Marcy. all right no worries Okay, Julian, Tammy, are you guys ready to speak? Yes. I'm gonna go ahead and pop off my Perfect. video then. Okay, thanks, Marcy. Um, Melissa, Brenda, looks like we need to change the slide. Got it.
Is it saying that? Can you guys see it? There we go. Is it on there now? It's up. Yeah. I can see it. Okay. Julie and Tammy, can you hear us? Yes, I'm here. Can you hear Julie? I can hear Tammy. Julie? Is, Ju <laughs> is Julie with you? She's supposed to be. She said she was on. Okay. Let's see. I do not see her on. Come on. Let's see. She said she can hear everything. I guess we just can't hear her. She would need to Is do your microphone star. unmuted? If she's on the phone, she could do star six. To unmute herself. Is she on the phone? There we go. <laughs> can you hear me now? Hey. Yes. <laughs> hey. <laughs> Thanks. There Obviously, Tammy and I are a little bit new to this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Um, but neither one of us is a really professional, credentialed kind of gal. We're both just moms who um, have a lot of kids and homeschool, and our children have special needs, um, a wide variety of them, including complex medical needs and. Um, autism, auditory processing disorder, uh, a lot, dyslexia, dysgraphia. We've, we've got yeah. a lot. The list um, goes on and on. It, it really does. Uh, when we were trying to compile a list, it really did go on and on. Um, but hopefully we can provide you all with some encouragement. Yes. Um, both of us have had kids in the public school system um, at various points, and I actually do have two that are still in public school right now, or well, they were until a couple weeks ago. Um, but it's just such a different environment and experience as a parent, I think, to try to adjust to homeschooling your child who has special needs and is used to the structure of the school system uh, without any real preparation or input on the curriculum. You're just having to work with what they've given you. Um, and hopefully between us, we can encourage you a little bit. <laughs> yeah, that's our main goal here is, is to let you know that you are more incapable of, of doing this. Um, and you'll see, we'll go over some resources that we put together. Um, here shortly. Um, there's so many things out there to help get you through this journey. Um, and like Julie, you had said too, um, I was looking back in your message here, um, if you wanted to mention again about how, um, what the parents are going through right now, it's not necessarily possible, but it can still be adaptive to work for your child. Yes, for sure. I um, actually have a child who's in school right now. Um, she's working through this gigantic packet of fourth grade material. Um, and she has some uh, learning disabilities. And while she can read very well, she cannot spell and writing is a very taxing experience for her. Um, and so I have just decided that the school supports are not in place because they can't be. So I will do the things that need to be done. So as I watch her work and I see areas where she's struggling, I'm just making adaptations. So for example, she had a math worksheet where they needed to write numbers in expanded form. And they were numbers like 18,175,364. So that's a lot of letters to write. And there were like 20 of these things that she had to write out like that. So I let her write the first seven. I could see where she knew the information, but was really struggling to actually write it and get it across that she knew it. So I just intervened and I had her tell me out loud all the numbers and I wrote the rest of them for her. And I made a note um, on a piece of paper how I adapted the lesson to meet her needs. And for any little thing that I've had to do to adapt for her, um, and for my other son, but he has a really long IEP, so those things are easier for me to measure and adjust to. But I've just kept notes, 
And when I return the packet with her, I'm going to hand those notes back because I feel like that's good, valuable data collection for the school. So while her teacher can't make those notes because she's not there, I know her better than anybody else. And I can make those notes for them so they can continue to have information that's useful. Um, and I'm hoping that that will be supportive information when it's time to reevaluate her IEP or 504, whatever we end up with next year. Um, and I feel like as parents, we know our children better than anybody. And you all certainly do. Absolutely. You go to the appointments, you spend the time with your child. There may be people who know more about your child's needs theoretically than you do, but you know them and you are the expert on your own child. So I just want to make sure that people feel empowered as you're trying to adjust to this new environment to do what you think is best for your child. Write the stuff down, present it to the school, and let them know. Yeah, um, that's so true to, to trust your gut. Um, just to share a brief example, um, our one of our children was in public school last year who has a list of um, special needs, um, special educational needs, and he was not making any progress. Um, and we finally had a education um, evaluation done. And it turns out that everything I had been doing with him at home was exactly what she recommended. So um, I would say trust your gut. And like Julie was saying, you can adapt anything to make it work for your child. Um, we don't want to just, you know, load kids with busy work. They're just going to get frustrated and overwhelmed. Um, and so there's there are ways that we can make sure they're getting the knowledge and make sure that they're understanding um, without them frustrated when it's over. Um, and I think that's one of the beauty of homeschooling is, is that we can go and we can adapt and find what works for our children. Because like Julie said, you know, we know them best and we know what's going to make them you know, get excited, motivated, and make them driven to learn. And I think that's a good point, really, is that you as a parent, you know what motivates your child. And so I know my kids look at a packet. Now, I will say one one of my children will look at this packet every day and like cannot wait to fill it out because he just loves to complete a sheet of stuff. But yeah, absolutely. <laughs> my other kids are not the type that want to fill out a sheet of stuff and that's just not motivating for them so we have just kind of adjusted I know that she needs to change up what she's doing every now and then so I let her pick what subject we do first yeah. I um, have been using a lot of um, it's on the slide I'm sure but uh, Go Noodle, which many of you probably already know about, but it's free and it's on the internet and it's full of silly songs, dancing and games. And when we finish a subject, we take a brain break and we do one Go Noodle activity. And that amount of movement and like sensory input is enough to help her refocus to move on to the next task. Um, so you yeah, I'll send mine outside to the trampoline. Oh, we use a lot of trampolines yeah. in our house. Too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, five minute breaks, trampoline, and they just get some reset and ready to go. So, and yeah. then um, also on our slide is a number of uh, different things that we've found between us over the years. Uh, some of them are probably things you're familiar with, and others probably um, maybe not so familiar. But there's a lot of homeschooling resources that even with my children I'm doing public school packets with, I have kind of pulled some of those aside um, and started using them to kind of help my kids in areas I see they need it. Um, one mm -hmm. example is a program called Night Zookeeper that's on the slide. Um, it's a little bit pricey, but for me it's been worthwhile. Like I said, my daughter has a very difficult time writing. She doesn't spell well and she finds the whole experience of writing just demanding and frustrating and she's not motivated to do it. Um, but this is an online program where they create their own zoo and they make up their own characters and they have to write these fact sheet stories about every character. So they have to write in order to move on to the challenges and there are vocabulary, spelling, grammar, all sorts of little challenges and educational things built in there as games so they don't realize they're doing schoolwork. Um, and the program provides a tutor who reads all the things your child submits and provides them with feedback to help them make it better. And so uh, we've been doing all our schoolwork that's required for school in the morning and she's been playing that for hours every afternoon which 
um, has been amazing for me because she hates to write and she's like really enjoying writing things right now. Um, and so there are lots of resources like that that are out there that can help you. Like if you have a child that struggles with phonics, Teacher Monster to Read is free um, and can help them with some of those sounds or Reading Eggs is an excellent program. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. And then Tim probably has some other suggestions as well. Yeah, um, and I was going to say, too, um, there have been times when, um, for whatever reason, there's been a lapse in speech, um, whether, you know, whatever the case, like right now, everyone's out of, out of school, and so there might be uh, a lapse with working with your speech therapist. Um, Gemini is an excellent program. Um, I actually just learned about it myself, and it helps your child learn all kinds of things from language development to articulation to writing to reading whatever that specific need is and it's tailored towards your child um and it's with videos so they can be um super engaging um and keep your keep your child interested so they're a really good um if nothing else to supplement to help your child with language development and such um, that's a great one um, Julie, you were saying something too about the Google extensions. Yes. So if you have a child who would use um, any sort of assistive technology, uh, like talk to type or any of those things, if you aren't aware already, uh, Google extensions has a way for you to just kind of get into your Google, especially if your teachers are using Google Classroom, um, and just make those things happen. Um, I'm not super duper tech savvy. My husband is the one who does all that, but um, even I could sort of figure it out uh, once he showed me what to do. And my teenage son doesn't need any help. He just needs to know where to click and he can set up the things he needs. Um, he has really significant dysgraphia and um, he's homeschooled, but he uses Google extensions um, and uses a lot of talk to type kind of things so that he can get across what he needs to say uh, to make sure that it's coming across where he can practice this. He has speech issues too. So that function lets him practice his speech and then see it typed out so that he knows if he's articulating clearly or because um, the errors will come. For example, he says per instead of pure every single time and he sees it every single time he practices or uses that feature. Um, but there's a number of things available in that, and the link is for sure on the slide for that one. Yeah, I think that's a, an absolute gem right there. Um, there is a book, if any of your children are dealing with um, dyslexia, that is really, really good. It's listed there on the slide that um, is super encouraging. It um, gives him, he tells his story. He's very successful, and he tells his journey that he had in school and how he's overcame that and become very successful. Um, another thing that I've learned that I forgot to put on that slide that has helped my child in learning their sight words um, is called Snap Words. And you can go to snapwords.com. And it is a stack of um, sight words, but they're made out into pictures. And so the child sees the picture associated with the word. I had a video I could show you, but and then they also do emotion with it. So you're again using all that sensory input, visual, movement, everything. And these snap words have been a godsend because now he's learning sight words left and right. And last year, he an entire school year, he learned. Left and right. um, so I wanted to be sure I put that out there, simply because it wasn't on the slide. Um, oh, that's another good extra one. math is great. It's that. free. It's a wonderful. Yeah, it's a wonderful, it's free, it's a great way to practice their math facts every day. Um, yeah. But there's just, there's just so many tons of resources. And, um, you know, if you ever decided to jump on the homeschool journey, the CSRA has the largest homeschool association in Georgia. We are everywhere. Um, with, and many of us do have children with special um, educational needs. And we're out there. There are so many groups and activities um, and support groups and, and wonderful parents that um, you'd never be alone. So, um, yeah, either way, either way you go, whether you stay or go, there's going to be support um, for you and your child. Yes. And like she just said, there's a 
huge community here um, of homeschoolers. And I think that I mean, Tammy and I are certainly very willing to help you if you need resources while you're trying to do the school at home. Um, please just reach Absolutely. out and let us know and we'll help you find things. Um, I think between us, we've probably spent a million hours reading about curriculum and trying to find the oh, right yes. things that work for each of our kids. Um, so we do have lots of ideas and knowledge. Um, and I didn't want to just bombard you with a thousand things. But if you do need any questions answered or just basically what to do, the one last thing I forgot to mention that I did want to make sure I said was I know I've seen all over Facebook these very rigid schedules and um, I do have an autistic child so I definitely understand we need like a schedule. But please give yourself some grace. I know some of you are probably trying to work from home. You're probably still going to work. I don't know what your schedule is like, but um, a routine seems to be what works really well in our home. We do things in a certain order. We start at the same time every day, but there's a lot of flexibility in that. If math is a disaster one day, we don't just keep going. We just stop and we reset and we do it again a right. little bit later. Um, so just yes. give yourself some grace because this is hard. And even for those of us who have homeschooled for a long time, this is still just such a different thing. We can't go anywhere. You can't the social interaction you're used to. So we know it's tough. And I just really imagine that it's a lot to have thrown on you trying to figure out how to meet your child's needs at home, how to educate them without any preparation or um, right. just real information. It's, so do know we're here and we're happy to help you. Um, and we both uh, what we don't know, I feel like we can probably find somebody who does. Um, so feel free to reach out and do know that we really are um, hoping to be supportive and to help you all to um, find what you need. <laughs> Thank you, Julie and Tammy. We appreciate you. Is there anyone who has any questions for Julie and Tammy? I wanted to say thank you to Julie and Tammy for coming on. Um, they are people that I personally lean on when I'm stuck and looking for resources for my kids, you know, when we can't can't quite get it through public school or, or whatever. Um, so thank you, ladies. And I did want to add a side note um, to what Julie had said about the modifications. Um, Make sure that you're documenting that in writing and send it via email. And that's to Julie and to anybody else that's um, that's listening. Um, make sure that you document that via email because if it's not written down and you can't prove that you um, submitted that, it never happened. Um, so again, thank you both for all of those great tips and uh, you know how you're accommodating curriculum and making things work for your kids. Thank you so much for inviting me. Oh, absolutely. I, you guys are some of my resources, so I, I definitely wanted to include who I lean on in, in these tough times. Did we have well, any questions you. from parents or anyone well, else? Thank really you for having us. Absolutely. Thanks for joining. Thanks. Okay, so if every no questions, then we'll go ahead and start with um, Naomi, and we can go from there. Fabulous. Great evening, everyone. Um, I am Naomi Williams. I, my title, if you will, is a family support coordinator, but really I call myself a Jackie of all trades, a master of one, <laughs> and that is living my best life now. Um, I'm a health educator by training, but it's my home life that has um, given me the experience, if you will, um, to navigate through systems. So I have a wonderful 10 year old who is a train wreck on paper, but he is not that paper. He and I have this conversation all the time and we do that with others as well. Um, so Noah is, I, I feel like I'm on this island um, a lot of times by myself, but thanks to friends like Tanya, um, I realize I'm not. So even though my son has what's considered severe profound disabilities, so a lot of the things that you all talk about, um, 
or that you go through is foreign to me because that's not my world. But I do understand the disability world um, and navigating systems. And so my son is in um, a severe, profound class. Um, so doing, doing school at home has been a bit, a bit of a, um, a bit of a challenge. And I said, you know, I'm not a teacher. That's not what I went to school for. And I'm okay with that. Um, and I'm not going to stress myself out over this. Uh, so as you can see, there are a lot of things, um, that I, that I do. Um, I have a variety of certifications, I've gone through the partners in policy making, um, I've worked with Parent to Parent of Georgia, I'm a supporting parent, I've worked as a trainer with them. I, I have immersed myself uh, in trying to get as much information as I possibly can in order to help my son, um, and not just him, but other families as well. Um, prior to having him, I, I worked with an organization that I ended up could have been a, a poster child for in the sense of um, infant mortality and low birth weight and just trying to reduce all kind of stuff. And here I become um, that very thing that we were working to not become and to no fault of my own. So with that, I have learned prior to my son, um, I knew how to navigate systems, but after having him, was thrown into the throes of figuring it out. Um, it's not fun, it's not easy, it's uncomfortable, um, but it's necessary. And so what I work to do is help parents with that. There was a time in applying for, um, between SSI and waivers and just all the types of assistance that you can possibly get and trying to figure out school, I, I had all this paper and I just said, I wish there was someone where I could just take everything that I'm dealing with and just put it in their lap and they help me figure out where do I start and then how do I navigate? And there wasn't anybody. Um, so that's what I do now with families. Um, I do have an outside job that I work at, um, at a local hospital. Um, so I help families there as well. So I help families navigate the medical system and through that help navigate the educational and community systems as well. Um, because uh, although we're in 2020, a lot of times we, people still have a mentality of um, those people should be somewhere else, shouldn't be here. Um, so as you're as you're looking at the slide, you can see all the things um, that I that I do and work to do, and I don't want to belabor that point. Um, what I do want to highlight is two of the things that tend to get missed often. Um, I became a yoga yoga instructor. Um, it saved my life and it actually saved my son's life. It taught him how to breathe correctly. Um, and I'm a grief support specialist, and so helping people process grief. And this is, we are in a time that is unprecedented for us, and there's a lot of unknowns. There can be a lot of anxiety um, that is happening, and, and being able to know how to, um, I'm not going to go into the self-care because I know that's something that Jenny's going to do, but just knowing that we have to take care of ourselves. So a couple of things that I do and being able to integrate the yoga and grief support, um, this is a time where not only are our children grieving their friends and some of their freedom and potentially graduation, um, having <laughs> mom and dad as your teacher <laughs> trying to figure that out, you know, our children have losses. But we as parents have losses as well. Um, a, a very simple one um, where some of the, the teachers from the schools are going through and doing a parade through the neighborhoods. Well, my neighborhood isn't on that list 
for the teachers to come through because the the my son, even though we're, we're zoned for that school, doesn't our neighborhood doesn't fall into that's where he should go. Does that make sense? Our, our neighborhood falls into a different typical school for him to go to, but the school that he's in, there's only one class where he can go. So I want to see his teachers, um, but we can't. And so it may sound simple, but that that's a loss. There are, are a lot of losses that we don't recognize or we don't acknowledge. We don't, um, we don't honor ourselves to recognize um, things that we have lost and, and how that impacts us and how to move on. Um, so that's one of the things that I really work with parents to do is to process their grief, to process um, the things that you're going, going through, um, not having a neurotypically developing child, whatever that looks like. Um, the other thing I would love, I want to leave with you through the grief support and through the yoga, through navigating systems, um, I have three B's. I actually have a, an entire curriculum. It's called Bases. It's the basis of processing grief. Um, the, the, but I want to give you the three B's. The first one is to breathe because that's what you control. You can control your breath. And when all hell breaks loose and when everything else is chaotic and there's nothing else you feel like you can control, you can control your breath. Take a deep breath and work to reset. Somebody had mentioned before we started recording about um, feeling like they had symptoms, um, you know, the shortness of breath and not necessarily feverish, but just not feeling well. Just about every morning, if I turn on the news before I've done my meditation and my breathing, I have a panic attack. Um, and so it's a matter of deciding what am I letting in um, and finding my breath. I, I know my symptoms um, when a, a panic attack is about to begin. And so I can say, okay, let me take a breath. So that's the first one, breathe. The next one is to find balance. What does balance look like to you? I always think of a scale. My scale does not look level. My scale is always going to be altered, and that's my normal, and I'm okay with that. I don't aim to get here. If I'm here, then I know something is wrong, and there's some more things that go into the balance piece of it, but just knowing what does balance look like for you? What does balance look like for your children? And then being able to... Um, get back to what your normal is. And then the third B is working to find the beauty in all of this, whatever this is. Um, I will say there were some, some tragic things that happened within my family last year. Some things that I never thought would happen with my son who is nonverbal, who is, um, he communicates, he just doesn't use words all the time. Um, some things I just never thought would happen. It tore me to pieces. But the beauty that has come from it is we have found a communication device that we are able to begin working with others to see him. Um, the best way to say it is to see him as person without significant disabilities to see him as a person who has value and who can communicate um and so that's what i work to do i look to see i and words matter um we are in a time where things can be very uncomfortable but it's important to find that place um to to find a, a the ability to get comfortable in being uncomfortable. And in that way, when you feel it, you can process it, and then you're able to grow from it. And we're able to teach not just ourselves and our children how to do that, but the people who are around us. Um, and so just to give two last thoughts, um, 
words, words matter. A lot of times we talk about disabilities, we talk about deficits, the things that our children don't have. And while those things are important, it's important to focus on their abilities, their capabilities, and teaching them that they are worthy, and not just them, but teaching the people around them um, their value. So one of the things that I've done, and I work with um, other families, as they need it. Um, one of the things I've done for my family is my son is an artist, so we have Noah Land Art. Um, again, my son is 10, um, but knowing that when people see him, they don't see value, they don't see how he can contribute to society. And so my goal is to make him a productive member of society and as independent as he possibly can be whatever that looks like and i know i'm talking a lot about my family um but this is where it starts so by working with someone who is significantly severe and profoundly um what people would say disabled i say differently abled there are a lot of things that we do we just do it differently um but it's being able to see how do you make this work and so again we're in this time that we haven't seen in our lifetime um our parents haven't necessarily seen in theirs great great parent great great grandparents maybe um but how do we how do we set our kids and our families up for success and that's what i work to do with families as we navigate through systems I'm Naomi D. Williams, and my information is on the slide. Thanks for having me. Thank you, Tanya, and everyone else who put this together in the short time that we did it. This is amazing, and I'm so excited of the new contacts that we have. Thank you, Naomi. And uh, did you have a link for Noah's art? Is that included under your website? It is. If you go to the Naomi D. Williams, um, all of his things are under there. I have a blog um, as well, but everything is linked to the Naomi D. Williams. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I mean, if you had to give parents one positive thing to walk away that makes them feel good and lets them know that you understand and that, you know, this is not going to last forever. We're, we're going to get through this. What would you tell them? trying to unmute myself. I would say, um, you got this. You got this. It's not proper English, but you got this. <laughs> Just breathe. You, you will make it through. Be who you are. Don't try and be anyone else. You're their parent first and find joy in that. Don't let this um, crisis take away the joy of your parenting. Great. Is there any questions for Naomi before she leaves? Okay, so our next presenter is going to be Jenny Young, and she's going to speak about mental health and self and self advocacy. All right. Thank you, Brenda. Um, I could just jump right in and piggyback right off of what Naomi said. I think she might be my soul sister out there. Glad to have heard from her today. Um, yes, so much of what she talked about is what I want to get into, but I guess first I'll introduce myself just a little bit. I am Jenny Young. Um, I am 40 and I've got four kids and several of them have various levels of needs. Um, I think three out of the four would be considered twice exceptional and it's just quite a fun ride. So I am also a veteran mother in this field. Um, but of course, like many of us, that's the reason why we jumped into this other part of ourselves. So, um, I am currently in the last stage of graduate school, which is internship. Um, I'm finishing up technically in the last, like, in the next seven weeks. So I've got two classes and then literally all I have left is internship. So I'm interning right now in Marietta, Georgia, at this fantastic place called Park Care Consultants. And um, they see just a whole slew of kids, mostly um, neurocognitive disorders, um, 
Tourette is their specialty, which is how I know them. My son is 11 and a half. He has Tourette's. He has OCD. It comes with friends. So um, he's got a, a bit of alphabet soup after his name, but um, finding someone that knows that specialty kind of sent us on that journey. So um, I'm really enjoying my time there. And I kind of jumped in here to say, um, just to talk about self-care. And I titled it Gracious Caregiving During Times of Uncertainty. And I think grace is a word that I heard um, Julie actually say uh, a few presenters up. But that's something we desperately need right now. And Naomi actually pointed out that this is something that we as parents have never been through either. Um, and I actually had that moment when I spoke to my eight-year-old and said, hey, you know, mommy's not going to get everything right. <laughs> because I also have never been through this, but it's not that I don't have any idea how to navigate this because my experience allows me some, well, experience um, to at least come up with good ideas. So um, I couldn't help but talk about self-care and I feel like me and we already handled so much of that really well, um, but I wanted to point out, I read this today, there was a Harvard Business Review um, article that went out and it and it specifically talked about grieving that that's part of what we're all going through whether we realize it or not um and that the pace of our life has not really allowed us previously to spend time processing and now we're kind of sitting with these feelings that we may not even recognize them as grief so i thought that was pretty interesting that naomi also brought that up um, and i liked the word that she chose to use as honor we need to make sure that we honor ourselves in this process. So I am also a mom and I think in general moms typically go and put our our people first, our kids first, our husbands first, what, however it works out in your system, your family system. We have a tendency to like put ourselves at the bottom of the chain. But I know y'all are all familiar with the, you know, the airplane spiel when they say, you know, oh, Grown-ups, you got to put your oxygen mask on first, but we all know if you think through the process, the reason is because you're going to do no good to anyone if you A, can't breathe, or B, or passed out on the floor. So this scenario is no different. Um, I don't know how to navigate this. It does feel a little bit like trauma to me, honestly, but we won't know the full extent of that until it's, say, over, or we're on the other side, or we've adjusted somehow to this new normal. And since we're in the middle, we don't even really know which of those realities is to come. So um, I kind of put together just, uh, let's see, I guess there were six things. Um, and I'll just go through them because that's pretty simple. But self-care can mean a lot of things. For some people, it's eating you know, a piece of cake after your kids go to bed. But for some people, eating a piece of chocolate cake would not be considered self-care for them. They would think, oh, I've fed myself a salad today for lunch. So that's their version. So you really do have to kind of know yourself and um, really know what you need, what your family needs. So the first point that I made was do a body system check. Um, I heard, I'm just piggybacking off Naomi because it was great. It, it was like meant to be. Um, she talked about how if she jumps right in and does the news first thing in the morning, she can feel herself having a panic attack coming on. Um, that's because she has learned to check her body systems. So you can literally go from head to toe, toe to head, or whatever, you know, out to in, in to out. But if you can consciously think through, where am I holding tension? Um, I think even now, like, I'll take you through your head, your head body system. Um, right now, are your lips pressed together? And if they are, are, is your tongue pressing up against the top of your mouth? Are your teeth clenched? Then like talk about your face. Is is your brow furrowed? You know, are your is your mouth pursed? Because sometimes we do this, you know. And if you can consciously take a minute and walk through, that was just my face. That wasn't even like my head. Um, I can hold tension in my like sometimes I'll realize my tongue is pressed, jammed up to the roof of my mouth. There's some kind of tension being held here. So just do a body systems check. It doesn't take two minutes, three minutes, five at the most if you're really intent on getting through your whole body system, but that's a way to bring awareness. Okay, I'm holding tension. Where am I holding tension? And if you want to take it further, you can say, um, why am I holding tension if you want to go there? But at any rate, you can release that tension. And that, of course, goes into the breathing that Naomi was talking about. So I love that. 
I'm actually going to walk you through it. Um, I sat through the Southeastern ADHD conference not too long ago, and I sat under um, a neuropsychologist, neuropsychiatrist, well, Joe Ackerson is his name, and um, he was speaking on something, but he was talking specifically in that moment about anxiety. And ironically, I actually love yoga too, and the breathing portion is great, but sometimes I really do get hung up on the breathing. I'm like, this breathing is not as, pattern does the other one you know so even breathing can get us hung up when we're anxious so he had a perfect little example and i'm going to give it to you because i just walked away and thought if if this is all i walk away with from this whole conference this is fantastic so um his suggestion was and he takes his clients through this deep breathing by by starting your breath by blowing all the way out so and then when you get to the bottom you just relax and your body will automatically take that inside breath. So it's sort of the reverse because you always think, okay, now I'm gonna breathe in real slow. But his, his suggestion was no, start with breathing out because once you force the air, but not rudely, but gently force your air all the way to the bottom and then relax your body, it automatically fills back up. So it doesn't take as much thought process of, you know, am I doing this as equally, in and out and did I count to four and all of that. It's just very easy to get all the way to the bottom of your breath and then just relax. The other point about that that I wanna make is don't shortchange yourself when you take those breaths. A lot of times I'll take one and one helps, it really does. But his point there was that three deep breaths is the beginning of um, calming your physical reaction to stress. So if you're immediately anxious, the, the way to calm that to really begin that process is to take three. So don't shortchange yourself, give yourself three breaths. And then the next one I call the mini vacation. And this really, I think went back to what Naomi said about honoring yourself is, um, I call it the mini vacation. This is really personal to me because there are times in my life, um, I did homeschool several children for a while as well. And now most of them are in public school. One is in private school, um, but, some of those homeschool days where you just never get a break and you're still doing math and your husband's walking in and you know it's supposed to be dinner time and you're just like you have this look on your face you know um my mini vacation would be a walk to the um to the mailbox and i would close the door behind me so i didn't have to hear anything that was occurring in the house and i walk slowly and intentionally and i would be breathing and I would be taking in nature sounds. I could hear the birds chirping, like the world's smallest walk to the, to the mailbox and the world's smallest walk back, but I would call it my mini vacation because sometimes that's all you're given. Um, and especially since we're all in each other's space right now, we're all, you know, quarantined or whatever we're calling it, social distanced together. Like I have four kids and a husband and myself and we're working from home and this is, just it's full there's no space that's mine i mean you know um we've got to give ourselves we've got to honor ourselves enough and care enough about ourselves that we'll take those mini vacations even if it means you know i woke up i don't know 15 minutes before the kids and this morning i took a cup of tea out onto the the deck you know um it was wet and i just made myself a dry spot because i knew i needed that mini vacation so whatever that means to you i mean it could be something as simple as um you know putting on your favorite sweatshirt just because you know or i mean you just in this scenario you just kind of have to know yourself you know um the other one is sort of words that we use in our house as well so the fourth thing is three helps and three hindrances and i've got to figure out what i was really talking about there but in our house i will check the kids if they say something they don't realize it's rude a lot of them lack theory of mind and they'll say you know um they'll just blurt something out you know and they don't realize that it's probably rude and you shouldn't say it at least not in that way and so i'll say does that help or does that hinder the situation i think naomi also kind of um talked about that a little bit in talking about words and how words matter and so um i don't know where I went. Oh, here. We, I often ask something like, 
did this help or did this hinder? And I think it's a valid question. It pertains to like your internal emotional health. So like if Naomi says she woke up and, and read the news, this would be true for me too. If I jumped right into the news, would that help me or would that hinder me? And that answer might be different for different people. So this is where you kind of really have to know yourself. Like it may really help to calm. I don't know how, cause I can't relate to this, but I do think I have friends that it helps them to know what's going on for the day or what's going on in the world or whatever. Um, for me, it just creates anxiety. So I don't need to know that yet, you know? Um, so just make a list. It doesn't have to be, it can be, I just said three things. Cause three seems like you don't want to go less than three, but you can definitely do more if you want three things that are definitely helpful for you and three things that are hindering you that maybe you want to swap those out. So instead of me scrolling through Facebook first thing in the morning, I should, maybe I'll do things that help me like grab that cup of tea and slip out and hear the birds chirping. So that's pretty easy, but it helps you to nail it down because I think sometimes when we're, we are already in those moments of anxiety, we're, um, our brain doesn't operate the way it's supposed to when you're anxious. And I, I think that's worth pointing out too, because we're about to get to that part of the slide as well. Um, because that's true for our kids. I mean, it's true for all brains. They just don't work in stress mode. And we are also stressed. We also have questions. We also are unsure. Um, and I think it's, it is like honoring yourself to, to give yourself the tools and you can write it down three helps, three hindrances. And that way, when you're feeling stressed out, okay, what's going to help me. And then how do I keep from going there again? Um, and then reach out. So that's number five. And I think that's super important. I think we're feeling all feeling very isolated right now. Um, and I know, especially in the mental health field, that isolation is, is actually pretty much a sign of things like depression. And so we want to be very careful with that because we are forced at this point to be very isolated. We need to find alternative ways to reach out. I know, especially as special needs moms for us, many of us have worked very hard to have those like helps and those tools and those support people. And now it's like, oh, you know what like my son's um like mental health therapist so you know cognitive behavioral she's not doing anything at all and i get that because it's a little bit more difficult with children telemental health is difficult with children but oh like i'm kind of wondering like thank goodness i have you know mo almost have a degree in this <laughs> i'm very close um because at least i can kind of manage and help him through things if he's really struggling but like what about the moms who don't and they don't have the first, I have, I have filled in many phone calls already this week. How do I get through this? How do I get through that? And these are people that would normally be able to reach out to someone they've already filled that need. So, um, do reach out, find the way I put in my resources on there, especially I put, um, like zoom, I've got my kids pretty well locked down normally um so they can't just surf everywhere and call all the people but in this situation we do have a little bit more of a leeway allowing them to messenger kids app you know their friends so they can connect or if my son asks me for my phone one more time <laughs> but he just wants to reach out you know he doesn't want to feel alone either um but that's true for us as well so the one point about that i really want to make is that put it in your calendar, like make a date, make an appointment with your bestie or another mom that really knows the trenches with you, put it in your calendar and say, okay, well, mommy has an appointment at, you know, 8 p.m. on whatever day. Like, just like you would put in a therapy appointment, put it in your calendar, that way you don't push, keep pushing it back and pushing it back because when we get to the bottom, we just do, those things get left off and it can't always be us because we need to be the foundation and the stability for our system and our, I call it my crew, my crew as well. And then the last thing is you do you. And I think, um, I want to say Tammy and Julie talked about this as well. Like I've seen them too. I've seen the, the, the schedules and I mean, it's great. It's a great idea. And I have kids that really thrive off schedule. I do too, actually personally, but, um, I'm terrible at creating them. Oh, and that's respect. I would definitely call one of my friends who's type A and say, can you just make me, make me a schedule? Here's my problems that I would find. And here's what we need. And then make that work for me, you know? And I think that that's goes back to the reaching out. 
um, we can still do that, just has to be in a new way. So even some of the gaming systems, you can reach out. I don't do that, so I don't know, but my husband says you can reach out on Xbox. <laughs> um, so you do you, you have to know yourself. You have to know what works for your family and what doesn't. You can't expect, you know, your neighbor's version of homeschool to work for you. And I love that they keep pointing out that this isn't homeschooling. This is, this is, what are we calling it? I've forgotten the term, but my sister who actually does homeschool says that it's home learning. You're gonna learn right now at home, but um, it's not our job to be there teacher and to meet all the requirements that the government or whatever has dictated that we should meet. Um, we're going to provide learning opportunities for them in our own way because we're their parents and because kids learn through play and they're going to learn just by being in your presence if you're cooking or you're cleaning or whatever. Um, so you just got to know yourself. You if your kid is a worksheet kid, then that one's, to me, that one's easy. Get in there and pull, put some worksheets out and let them do it. Um, I only have one of those as well out of all the four. So they've already told me that real school is more fun than what I presented, even though, even though scavenger hunts in the backyard was my idea, but you know, um, you do you. That's really my main last point, I think. Thank you so much, Jenny. If you had to tell parents one positive thing or something they could walk away without stressing and, and, and gain one positive thing for the day so they're not so anxious, what would you tell them? Um, this is going to look so different in a year. That's the thing. And if a year's too long, then say, you know, a month. Because if you guys could take a minute and look back a year, it was so different and you will make it through we all will and we will do it together but don't fret about it now use your tools to keep yourself in a sane and calming space so that you can be that calm for your kiddos too but remind yourself okay if this may look terrifying or whatever the you know whatever the adjective you choose is right now but it's going to look so different in a year. Thank you for that tip, Jenny. And uh, is there any questions for Jenny? Do you, any of the parents want to know anything or are the presenters? So uh, thank you, Jenny. Um, I also have a son with Tourette, so I'm looking forward to connecting with you. And it looked like you had like some mental health background. so. Um, when you're, when you're ready, I definitely love to connect with you and thank you for coming on tonight. Thanks. I love that. Okay. So if we have no other questions, thank you so much, Jenny. And I'm going to present our next presenter, which is Christy Calvis. She's a special education attorney. Hi everybody. Thank you, Brenda. Jenny, that was fabulous. Great tips. Um, my name is Christy Calvis and I'm a special education attorney. I'm licensed in Georgia. I'm also a member of the California Bar. I'm not active in that state. Um, but my entire practice is focused on special education. And I have been doing this for 17 years. I started out as a school district attorney and in 2011 decided to focus my entire practice on special needs children. So uh, there's a lot of um, small font type on my slide, and if you're not able to see that, um, I'm sure that uh, Tanya or Brenda will email you a copy of, this, of the PowerPoint um, so that you can actually see what I've written there. But I have a tip for you. It's also on my Facebook page. So if you go to the Calvus Law Firm, you will see that I have a pinned post at the top of this uh, note to special ed parents. Um, and really what I wanna offer is um, throughout the school year, I assist families with analyzing their children's IEPs, making sure that they are compliant with federal law and state law, making sure we've got great goals, great evaluations. Um, parents call me for a whole host of reasons. I go to meetings with them. 
Um, but what I'm getting calls on now is, of course, no surprise. What do I do now that we have had a school closure? Okay. And the first thing I want to explain is that there is a distinction between online learning and homeschooling. Homeschooling is where you have actually filed a certificate of intent to homeschool with your State Department of Education, assuming and accepting full responsibility for being your child's teacher. You will select your curriculum. It will be in line with your state standards. You will teach your child and you will report to the state on any testing milestones. That is very different than online or distance learning. It is also very different from what Jenny accurately described as home learning. So let me first say that you're going to make a decision. What camp do you fall in? Has your district offered you online learning during this school closure? Do they have a distance learning software platform that you are logging into? If so, you will find that is much more sophisticated than the vast majority of other districts. Some districts already have in-house a distance learning platform, an online learning platform, and they actually have teachers who are trained in that software who for four, five, or six hours a day are presenting a virtual uh, instructional classroom to your student. There will be videos, there will be PowerPoints, there will be a place for your child to type in an answer, raise their hand. There will be interactive group discussions. There even may be times when the teacher works one-on-one -on -one with your student all uh, through a virtual platform. The teacher is 100% responsible for all instruction. The parent is the learning coach. That's how it's described by some of our online schools. If you're familiar with any cyber academies or uh, online learning platforms, then you'll know what I'm talking about. You are just there to facilitate helping your child pay attention, have the right materials. When it's time to take a break, you'll take a break, but you're not the teacher. So if your district is offering online learning, distance learning through a software platform, you are not the teacher and you don't have to supplement that curriculum or do anything to work on goals and objectives during this school closure period. However, many students who have IEPs that are involved or complex, if your child is moderate, severe, profound intellectual disabilities, Perhaps your child has significant ADHD. Perhaps your student has uh, behaviors, interfering or challenging behaviors. Maybe we see a lot of non-compliance or challenges with communication. An online or a distance learning platform is not appropriate in all circumstances for all children, particularly the children who are falling into the categories that I just described. Why is that? because if you look at your child's current IEP, it is designed for what? Direct instruction, six hours a day, in a brick and mortar building, in a classroom with visuals, tools, strategies, taught by a certified professional, certified special education teacher, who's had to actually pass certification examinations to do what they do, Sometimes there are two teachers in your child's classroom. There might also be a specially trained paraprofessional. You might have a behaviorist um, in the classroom or a registered behavior technician. Can you possibly implement that IEP in your home on spur of the moment, sudden disaster striking our nation, whether it's a hurricane or a fire or a virus? The answer is no. Your child's IEP was not written for you to implement at home, nor are you required to. So what I'm telling parents is, what is the district's obligation to your child? After 10 days of a school closure, your, the education must be provided. Number two, 
after 10 days, not only must the education be provided, but it needs to be individualized to your student. What does that mean? You need an IEP meeting. The IEP team needs to come together virtually or telephonically and decide how do we change this IEP and deliver the instruction and the uh, services in a way that meets your child's needs. We can't use the same IEP when you're at home. We can't assume that mom and dad are teachers. We can't assume that you are a behaviorist. Any assumption on the part of the district that a parent will succeed with that model is a flawed assumption and it will not be delivering an appropriate education. So remember when you, now that we've probably all reached that 10 day point, and again, this is a temporary school closure. We will return to school at some point, but where, where you really need to call that IEP meeting is about week three um, so that you can individualize what happens here. Now, if your district doesn't have an online software program where you're gonna have a live teacher streaming instruction to you through technology, supporting your child throughout all the curriculum, and providing instruction and goals, then what you're gonna get is a packet of information, papers, and maybe some games and other strategies and written out for you. Is that an appropriate education? Not after 10 days is what most lawyers are saying. Because again, this is not a short-term home-based or hospital homebound program. This actually after 10 days has to be appropriate learning for your student. Your child must be making progress. And so if there's not a virtual teacher streaming into your home and all you're receiving is, you know, offline packets and things of that nature, an IEP team cannot legitimately say that is an appropriate education unless you are a certified teacher mom or dad or grandma or, or auntie, unless you actually can implement that IEP using those materials, then you know the IEP is not offering your child an appropriate education. What we have here is an implementation problem. So again, call the IEP meeting, explain to them, they already know this, they're in crisis teachers, uh, districts are thrown into upheaval. The vast majority of districts in the United States don't have their own proprietary online learning platform. Either they're scrambling and they're trying to get it together, but you know, until they actually figure out do they even have resources to give students, if they give all general education students some type of software or online learning, guess what? They have to give it to every English language learner and they have to give it to every special ed student. There are districts that are buying 4,000 Chromebooks, right? There are districts that are buying 60,000 laptops because they know that in order to serve their population equally, general ed and special ed and English language learners, if there's a segment of that student population that doesn't even have access to the internet, what is that? That's a civil rights violation. So districts are trying to figure out what to do. If they don't already have an online learning platform, what they're doing is a hybrid, which is I'm gonna send you some paperwork to your home and I'm gonna offer you some online appointments. You can set appointments with me for some instruction. Is that sufficient? No, your IEP calls for a lot more than that. The IEP was written with the idea that we would be at a regular school. You can't imagine if your child would, were to go to school and your teacher would say, well, I'll go sit in the lunchroom over there with your mom and you can make an appointment and I'll see you for about 20 minutes or 30 minutes sometime today you would think that was bonkers. That's what's happening now because we're in a crisis. We're in an emergency. 
and districts are not prepared, but this is not the, the status quo, nor does this have to be your normal moving forward. So while teachers are trying to also figure out what's required of them, if your child is in a self-contained classroom or receives resource instruction, you need to be asking for the full segment. Okay, so if math is 50 minutes, you need instruction for 50 minutes, not mom struggles with the math paperwork at home and the worksheets and we log in and talk to Miss Jones for 20 minutes. That's not implementing the IEP. That's not an appropriate education. Right now for the first couple of weeks, that may be the best we can do, but I'm encouraging families week three, go ahead and request those IEP meetings. Um, you will quickly learn that they are short staffed and that it will be very difficult for our more complex children to receive group instruction the way they've been receiving it with one teacher who cannot move easily from desk to desk, cannot call on the parapro to follow through on instruction the way they've seamlessly been doing in a real time setting. And so many parents are asking me, how are we going to do this? Right, where we have seven children in our self-contained class and my child has behavior issues. When I try to make academic demands, I'm getting hit or I'm getting yelled at, right? And so what I say is, again, this is an IEP team um, meeting. It's necessary if you have the meeting and make notes and the team will guide you where to apply, you know, more of the pressure and where to let off. But the most important thing to know is that um, if you are relied on to provide the instruction, um, that's probably not going to be an appropriate education. And so what would we do if we had normal home-based instruction? That's another question I'm receiving. Well, if your child has ever been placed on home-based instruction for whatever reason, a teacher comes to your home. You're not responsible for teaching. The teacher comes a minimum of three hours uh, a week, sometimes 10, 15, 20 hours a week. And that's what home-based learning is. And again, I already explained what online learning is. It's a full school day. It's 25, 30 hours a week of virtual instruction. And you again are not the teacher. The teacher is delivering the instruction. So what we're seeing is sort of um, a, we're all upside down, right? Because this is all new to us and districts were caught unprepared. Um, so they're trying to do the best that they can by getting you some materials to work on. The, the true obligation doesn't kick in until after 10 days. At that point, you need an IEP meeting. Now, parents are saying, well, Christy, my child has significant needs and we're gonna see some regression. So my third point is, Yes, you probably will, just like summer, right? Or just like any winter break or spring break. We have to count on some regression and that's okay. Regression is normal for non-disabled students. It's normal for adults. It's normal for any human being to regress somewhat when we are not in constant action with a skill. The question is at what point should we start measuring for regression? Because as with any natural disaster that, that any country ever has, excuse me one minute, Alexa is giving me an alarm and I don't know why. Alexa, stop. Alexa, stop. Okay, so what we're doing now is looking at regression and asking ourselves, if we go into school closures and we start looking at 30 days, right now we're at about 10 school days. Some school districts are a little bit more. But when you reach about 30 days, what I'd like you to do, and, and I absolutely you know, um, loved some of the pointers that we had before, which is make notes for your teacher about what modifications you're having to do with your child. But if you need a progress chart so that you can note right now, where is my child on 
you know, one to one map number correspondence reading, where is your child on each of the goals? Pull out a copy of your child's IEP, look at the goals. If you have trouble probing those goals to get a current benchmark, right, you want to take some amount of data, right, and note, well, where, where is my child today, right, in March, March 23rd? If you don't know, go back and look at the IEP progress report that you most recently received. You should be receiving an IEP goals progress report every nine weeks. If you didn't get one in January or February, please ask your case manager for one. That will tell you the most recent data point so that you'll know, oh, okay, this is where we are right now. Three out of five times she can answer WH questions. Great. Okay, now you know where you were as of March 23rd. Keep, if, you, if you're inclined and you're a motivated parent and you, are, you have the bandwidth emotionally and you, know, you have the bandwidth in terms of time and you want to work on those goals, as opposed to requesting that the district actually provide that instruction, and I'll talk about that in a minute, then please keep data. Don't probe the goal every day, but ask the teacher, how often do you probe this goal? If she says three times a week, then you go and you sit down with your child, you deliver a little bit of the instruction, do some reading, and then ask the WH questions and make a note. What are we trying to do? We're trying to see if your child starts slipping in terms of their ability to perform that task or demonstrate that skill. You're probably going to see regression because we don't teach the way teachers teach. I mean, we are not, most of us are not certified special educators. So we may not know how to, you know, get the best performance out of, out of a child, but I'd like you to just keep track of the ground that might be lost. Don't stress, just keep a note of it. Why? Because when you go back to school, whether we go back in 30 days, 60 days, or a couple of months, the teacher will also do fresh probes to see how much ground was lost, if any. And that's how they're going to decide how much makeup or compensatory instruction your child's going to receive. Believe me, after hurricanes, fires, viruses, sickness, doesn't matter. Schools give compensatory instruction. So your focus right now is really on your health, your peace of mind, not the frustration with having to be the teacher overnight, not having to keep your child afloat. Um, you are not shouldering the full-time teaching job regardless of what it may look like. And that's a natural assumption. Parents are, are saying, really? Because I thought I was. For instance, I live in Atlanta. Gwinnett County has their, their own, it's the largest district in the state, they have their own distance learning, their own online platform. They are counting these days as traditional school days. So your child's getting graded if you're in Gwinnett County. But the question is, have they made appropriate modifications through IEP team meetings with all of the moderate, severe, profound kiddos, the ones with communication, challenges, the one with behavior, ones with behavior challenges, have they created appropriate IEP changes to ensure that that segment of the student population it can also make progress? And if the answer is no, then we have what, what we call a denial of an appropriate education. It's being denied. And so those parents just need to call IEP meetings and tweak those IEPs, get the right supports and services in place. And sometimes IEP teams, when they meet with you during a crisis, during a national emergency or a natural disaster, the teams will say, we're going to do an interim IEP. And instead of having 15 goals, we're going to pick the top five or the top three that are the most critical foundational skills. And, and we're going to hit those hard during this, this downtime. So don't stress if that happens because there will be plenty of time and there will be plenty of compensatory service and instruction for your child when we get back to business as usual. So don't allow fear and a sense of panic and frustration to overwhelm you. If you feel 
uh, scared, which most of us do, and fragile, most of us do, and uncertain, most of us do, then go light with what you're doing with your child at home. Go light on the education. I'm encouraging parents to focus on the functional activities and making it fun. This is unparalleled opportunity for you to you know, spend with your child. And if you're already worrying about a virus or loss of income or needing to stay at home and feeling stir crazy, you know, I'm inviting you to uh, place your focus where you actually come out stronger and healthier from this then you know the potential here is for parents to really have a lot of panic and anxiety and that's not what schools or teachers or special education attorneys or advocates ot's slps want for you and your family this is just an unusual blip on the radar so you know the first thing you would do is you would pull your child's IP, take a look at it, reach out to your case manager or your teacher, ask for an IP meeting. They may say, no, we're not doing IP meetings. In that case, what I'd like you to do is say, I'm gonna need to put this in writing. I believe we need an IP meeting because my child's not receiving an appropriate education. Many districts are misinterpreting the federal guidance that we received on Saturday. So go to my Facebook page if you need a copy of the letter that the Department of Education issued. Annual IEP meetings should continue. Now your child may not have an annual IEP meeting coming up, but if you need an amendment because you need to tweak that IEP to make sure that you're receiving appropriate services, whether that's more time virtually online with your teacher, whether that's different types of online, or different types of materials coming home to you. And listen, even if they don't have a distance learning or an online program, those districts are still providing face-to-face -face instruction. And you might need to say, I'm so sorry, but 20 minutes a day is nowhere close to what my child needs. We're into day 20, 30, or 40 of school closures. And I'm going, I'm going to have to document this in writing. And the way you're doing that is in a polite, professional way so that you can document, right, what you're later going to claim as a need for compensatory instruction. And again, it's not the end of the world if we're missing instruction. What's happening sometimes is we're projecting a lot of fear and anxiety onto this situation because we're, we're feeling so out of control. So um, the most important thing is just keep track of where your child is. Um, and listen, if you are in a situation with a moderate, severe, profound child, you're, and you are so stressed at the idea of doing any activities, any IEP implementation, please reach out to your school district and explain. Normally, they would send a teacher to you. Do you see if we had a hurricane or a fire, people could still come to you. They would still do makeshift buildings. Because of the virus, we can't do that. But they can come online with you somehow, even if it's FaceTiming through a phone. It's amazing what teachers are doing to support their students. And if you need an hour, two hours, three hours a day, then teachers are delivering that, but they're not getting a lot of guidance from their districts. So you are going to have to be the squeaky wheel if you have a child who has significant needs. And if you feel up to the task of doing this, again, this is not some sort of mandatory, you know, shove down your throat situation. Um, you could easily do the best that you could and still go back to school when we get back into business and request compensatory services. There will always be enough time for your child to make up uh, what was lost. And a lot of parents are, are panicked. They're saying, I'll never get this time back. And I say, you know what? When have we ever had a pandemic? This is weird. This is just strange and it's okay. So your child with an IEP gets to go to school until they're 22. We have time, right? And the most important thing is that you not lose your health and your peace of mind. As the parents, you're so pivotal to the peace that has to, has to happen at home. 
keep your composure and just stay really grounded and rooted in what you know is important. And your love for your child is the most important thing, right? i let the teachers do the teaching when, if and when we, you know, get back to a, a normal routine in the next couple of months. Um, but just stay grounded and try to make it as fun as possible. That's the other thing I would say. So that's it for me, Brenda and Tanya. Thank you so much, Christy. Uh, do you guys have any questions for Christy? Or I do. Is there a way? Go ahead. This is Naomi. I have a quick question. So when you talk about children with um, in the moderate or severe profound in doing training, so how do, so I've already reached out in the sense of um, I need help. I need to, I need y'all to come on face to face. Let's, let's do some things. But as far as the technology, so there are some things that we need technology wise that I don't have. So is that something that we can put in and request where they can order it and it comes to me or to how does how would that work so uh, Naomi what type of technology you're talking about an iPad or a Dynavox or um, actually this would be a switch interface um, so my my child is visually impaired as well so um, we're working with switches and a pod book but in order for for us to do some things with the iPad or with, um, I use the TV as a monitor to help with um, visual field. So being able to, uh, there are wires that I don't have. Yes, I would request them. So what you do is you pull the IEP, you look at the IEP, you see what has to, what assistive tech has to be there in order to implement the IEP. You call the IEP team meeting, and you say, okay, in order for me to do these, I need this, this equipment on loaner. And they will typically make you sign something um, and, and take responsibility for it being damaged. So make sure that your home, you have some you know, liability insurance on that if your child is prone to breaking things. But the other piece of that is that if you need training on particular strategies or how a teacher teaches, ask for parent training. That's a related service and ask the teacher to spend time with you either daily or weekly or a, for a couple of times teaching you how they teach showing you online through video streaming this is how i do math or this is how i do the handwriting or this is how uh we do the reading it's uh very important that you not only have the equipment but if you're expected to uh, follow through on some of that you will want to ask how do you do it again please don't get into the mindset of thinking that you are the teacher this is not homeschooling, right? You have not signed up for homeschooling just because it's taking place at home. As Jenny pointed out, it's home learning. Online and distance learning and what we're going through right now with the school districts is the schools have the teachers. All you do is support and facilitate. So Naomi, don't take on way too much, but definitely ask for whatever you feel like you're up for. And is there a way that they can contact you or how do you want them to contact you? Yeah, so it's easier for me to talk through individual situations with parents. If you would like to set up a complimentary consultation with me, it's calvuslaw.as.me. And you can find that at my website. You can find it on my Facebook page. You can Google me, Christy Calvus, and it'll pop up. But it's 20 minutes where we can really dive into the, um, your IEP and, and get more specific about what your child would need. And I'd be happy to chat with anybody. Perfect. Thank you so much, Christy. Um, again, if you guys have any questions, you can contact her that way. We're going to go ahead and go to our next presenter if no one else has questions. So Carol Taylor is our next presenter. She's an OT, and I'll let her go ahead and tell her about herself. Okay. Hello, everybody. Can everybody hear me? Yep. It's, it's my first time doing this platform, so I'm obviously doing it from my husband's computer. Well, my name is Carol Taylor. I am a pediatric occupational therapist, and I'm a former bilingual special educator. So I was a, a special ed teacher for five years before I became an OT. I do work in Atlanta. My clinic is in Atlanta. It is Play Matters. And uh, currently, I am 100% telehealth. So myself and my lead OT have gone to telehealth and one of the biggest questions parents are asking me now that everyone's at home is what can we do to support 
our children? How can we do OT at home? And let me tell you, my, my background is in sensory integration and sensory processing, you know, at, at my, my gym, I've got swings, I've got crash pads, I've got, I mean, you name it, I've got it in the clinic. And a lot of the schools have that equipment as well. So a lot of the children have been receiving what we call sensory diet at school. They've been getting that movement. Uh, the schools have the trampolines. There's a couple of schools that I consult at that have the sensory rooms with the swings, but now everybody's at home. So how are we going to support those families that are at home? And when Brenda called me, you know, one of the first things I said to her was, well, they need to implement the sensory diet that was given by their OTs. Um, but not everyone has that sort of communication with their occupational therapist. Not every OT is trained to do a sensory diet. Most school OTs have some training in being able to do that. But I think right now to give y'all um, some tips for everyone at home right now, uh, a sensory diet is a set of activities that you do periodically throughout the day. Um, my rule of thumb for most families is every two hours for about 10 to 15 minutes, do some sort of activity that promotes input into the muscles and joints, which is called proprioception, the stibular, which is moving your head through space, swinging, jumping, that sort of thing, and anything that's tactile. All of that right there will be able to um, support you in getting some sort of sensory diet. Um, I was working with a mom today and I gave her just one thing to do in the next coming days. I asked her to please find the one activity for your child that is calming and organizing. Um, you know, something like, what's your child's cup of coffee? Or for those of us at home now, what could be our glass of wine? <laughs> but what is that thing that just sorts a, sort of calms and organizes your child? And she and I were talking and she said, you know, um, orange juice. And I was like, oh, okay, orange juice. Like him drinking orange juice? And she said, no. So we had a, um, a juicer. And, um, you know, kind of explained to him how it worked. And she said, what I do is we call it making orange juice. He sits on my lap, he wraps his legs around me and he puts his arms around me and I wrap my arms around him and I squeeze him like I'm squeezing an orange juice. And I said, yes, that is exactly what I'm talking about. If you can integrate some of those sorts of activities, especially with a social emotional component, you're gonna get so much more than just the sensory diet. Um, real just quick, down and dirty, like I said before, every two hours, some sort of activity. Um, now there is a Facebook page out there, it's called Sensory Stuck at Home. Um, I think it was created within the last couple of weeks. I hadn't seen it before and then it popped up. And what's really nice there is that they are providing articles and links to um, some other ideas that you can do at home. Um, the Star Center in Colorado, uh, and the website is S as in sensory, P as in processing, D as in disorder, spdstar.org. They are also offering some sensory balanced daily schedules to give families some ideas of how they can provide their children this input. Um, some of the other things that I'm talking to families about, um, you know, what if you don't, you know, you just, you know, a lot of us are really busy right now. We're just trying to keep our jobs and then keeping our, our children occupied. But, you know, what can I do right now? And so what I've told parents too is if you can find these things around the home. First of all, your couch cushions are going to come off the couch, couch and onto the floor. You're going to use them as your crash pads. You're going to use them as your obstacle courses on the floor. You're going to use them to hop from one to another. It is going to become part of um, your sensory gym or your sensory diet. Um, blankets, lots of blankets. Um, you know, uh, I made my own ball pit. I made it with um, an old baby tent or like a dog tent that you can just throw balls or even stuffed animals in. That's another thing. You know, parents are like, I don't have balls. And I'm like, just find all the stuffed animals in the house, all the old towels in the house, all the old sheets in the house. See if you get in some sort of container. 
Uh, I like the little dog tents and the baby tents, and those have worked out really well. And I have been able to get a 14-year-old boy inside one of those tents and rolling in, in one of those uh, makeshift ball pits, and, and they absolutely loved it. Um, the other thing is to get some of that other movement. Um, I'm telling parents, you know, if you have a rocking chair, bring that out. If there was a rocking chair downstairs in the basement, if you know, you know, someone who has a rocking chair that they want to donate right now, get it because that's another way that you can do some movement. Porch swings, um, definitely, if you can find that. Um, the other thing too is uh, office chairs. If you have an office chair that spins, it rotates and rocks, bring that out for your child. They're probably going to need it right now. Um, so I'm from Atlanta as well. And today the sun came out. It was wonderful. Um, and I did the last half of my um, telehealth OT sessions with the families in the backyard. And that was pretty awesome. But definitely get them outside as much as possible. Um, the last thing I could say, you know, if you can find around the house are pool noodles. Just find some pool noodles. You can do so many different things with that, obstacle courses and things like that. But then when you have older children that are just too big for you know jumping off the the couch and and into the cushions you know what do you do and i think that is where um having the rocking chairs for them in addition to having those office chairs um I, you know and i don't know if this is even a possibility for us to do now depending where you are in the state but um you know the tracks around the high schools i don't know if those are still open and that would be great for some of the older kids. And there's lanes, so everyone can stay in a lane. Um, but, you know, uh, having those pieces out there too. Um, you know, I think right now, you know, listening to everyone speak, it, it is a very difficult time right now. And I think for our children, trying to maintain some sort of a schedule, but having a schedule doesn't mean it has to be rigid. It just means it has to work for everyone involved. Um, the sensory schedule um, or sensory diet that was provided by the Star Center in Colorado, it, it, it's really nice because it's color coded, but it says things like here's a calming activity, here's an alerting activity, and they broke it down across the day, which was really, really nice for parents. But again, it doesn't have to be nine o'clock, we have to do 15 minutes of vestibular input. Let's, you know, let's rock. It has to be meaningful. Um, if it means y'all are rocking, that means maybe you're rocking and singing a song, but just try to maintain some, some sense of order. It doesn't have to be a strict schedule, but because we will get back to our daily lives. Um, I don't know when, but we will. And I think that's one of the biggest things that talking with my families that, you know, we're probably going into summer. And at that point we lose school and we lose that continuity. And so that's where I'm really encouraging families. If you can create a sensory diet, if you can create those movement of activity, you know, every two hours, then you're establishing some sort of schedule and that can pull a lot of families um, and support them in trying to stay grounded right now. Um, the other thing that I'm really encouraging parents to do is to have quiet time. If there's a way to have quiet time at home, I highly encourage everybody do it right now. Um, I think for the sanity of the parents and for the children, that would be great. Uh, even if it's for only 30 minutes, um, that having that quiet time, I think, could be a part of your sensory diet as well. I've Actually, there's a couple of other ideas that I've got for this time. Um, you know, I'm talking to a lot of parents who say their children are incredibly busy. Um, there are some really amazing um, radio shows out there right now. If you have Sirius XM, you can download the app onto your phone or onto your computer. It, it's in your car and you already pay for it and now it's free on your phone. And I think they typically do 30 day trials, but there is a, a kids station, radio station called Kids Place Live. And every three minutes, something new is happening. And yes, I know it's auditory, but this auditory piece 
can really engage your child. And, and it's incredibly funny for parents too. So even when you're having a down day, if you listen to Kids Place Life, it'll pull you up. So that's something for a child who really needs to have some sort of intensity because it does change so quickly. And they play great music. Um, the other one is storynori.com. Storynori.com are free children's audiobooks, and most of them are fairy tales. And they have um, the, the people that are reading the books have British accents, and, and they're quite lively. We have also found that that has been really good for a child who um, just needs some intensity because through voice, um, they're hearing that intensity. Um, the other thing that I'm encouraging is that, you know, there are, I, I work with quite a few individuals who are experts in Legos and not everyone has all those Lego sets right now. Well, netbricks. I'm sorry, netbricks.biz, B-I-Z, uh, you can um, order Legos. I mean, you have to give them back, but you can order Legos to come and you can borrow them. And I know that I got them for my son and that is his calming organizing piece for him. And he was on it for two hours, quiet, happy, content. And I know he was, he was having a good time doing that. Um, the other thing too, is you all know that uh, Audible is offering free audiobooks right now. So I think that's another thing to be able to engage your child in during this time. But first and foremost, look around your house, see what you have. Um, I think today, you know, we can't use toilet paper because that was a good one that we typically used at home, but you know, we need it for other, we need it for the bathroom. But um, duct tape, if you have painter's tape, you can definitely do a lot of really neat obstacle courses at home. Um, just you need to just be able to get up and to do something with your child i had um one parent who said well i got up and i did i made him do bear walks up and down the the um the family room and i said okay all right you're you're doing you know a sensory diet i go how much fun did your child have and she goes well not really he didn't like it and i go well then yeah you were doing a sensory diet but there really was no engagement in it and i and i told you, you're going to get bigger bang for your buck if you take that bear walk that you just asked him to do and why don't you pretend you're like an animal rescuer uh why don't you pretend that he's an animal and you put down a pool noodles and he has to hop over them uh you know add an element of of play within it and and just because you're doing a sensory diet doesn't mean that it that it can't be playful actually it should be playful and if it's playful your child's going to want to do it over and over again if like that mom where her son says i want to make orange juice um that and i told her i go that not only became a moment for you to implement that sensory diet for him but it also became a moment for you to make a deeper emotional connection and especially during the time now that we're in, not only did that, does that child need it, but I told the mom too, you giving your child that proprioception was calming you down too. And you were loving it, weren't you? And she was like, yeah, I really enjoyed it. I go, yeah, I want you to enjoy the activities and the sensory diet pieces that you're doing with your children too. Um, I'm gonna open it up to questions if anyone has any, uh, you know, any uh, questions for me because of the fact that everyone is in a very unique situation. Uh, we're working with all sorts of, you know, living with all sorts of different age ranges. It's easy for me, you know, when you have the toddlers, it's so much easier to pull things out. Uh, and I think for the older kids, that is challenging. So um, does anyone have any questions for me? I don't have any questions, but I have a request. All the um, websites that you called out, could you put them in our group right, chat right, so right. that we can share them? You know, you know, um, what's so funny, <laughs> I am very uh, not tech savvy, but you know what I'm going to do? I am definitely going to send them to Brenda. <laughs> I will put all those websites down for you and I will email them to you. Okay. Uh, oh, I see where the chat is. It's that little button at the bottom, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I'm doing telehealth, but this is not my format. <laughs> so um, I see where it is right there. 
Yeah, I see. I see where I can put them in. So I will definitely go ahead and do that. Um, some of these websites too that I have been, um, I've used them not only with my clients and my families, I've used them with my own families, uh, uh, my own family and uh, Kids Place Life, Story Nori. Those have been uh, lifesavers. Definitely. Not only in the car when you're all stuck together, but hopefully at home when we're all stuck together. Thank you, Melissa. Thank you. I have a quick question. Yeah, I have a lot of clients that that um, they would benefit from those websites. So I oh, can, excellent. Yeah, excellent. And I'll, I'll definitely send you the Star Center. The Star Center in Colorado is um, the leading clinic in the nation in looking at sensory processing right now. Uh, they've got lots of uh, free parent webinars that are there. Uh, just looking at the sensory pieces. I think my favorite though right now to get to what you guys need is sensory stuck at home. I love that sensory stuck at home. That is, that is such a great name for a, a Facebook page and it is open. I don't believe that you have to um, be an OT to get onto that. I am seeing some posts for parents. Okay, great. So Carol, I had a kind of a question about um, telehealth. Yes. Um, do you see that this might be a solution for school-based um, OTs, SLPs? I, I will uh, tell you that right now in my experience, and this is only my, I guess my fourth day doing it, um, it's a lot of work. It's um, my body's more fatigued and tired than it has ever been in the gym. And uh, you know, I often tell my husband, you know, like when you're in a meeting like this, uh, you know, sometimes it only lasts for, you know, 20, 30 minutes and you do your presentation, you move on, but in the clinic, you're always on. You're always on, you maybe get two minutes in between each child, but you're always on. The telehealth has been difficult. Uh, I do think that with um, school-based OTs, if they're savvy enough in, begin in being able to engage with their students, then yeah, I think this can be really successful. I think one of the things that we decided as a group was that we would go ahead and engage the children first. So we don't start off first thing with handwriting, absolutely not. We're actually doing scavenger hunts. We actually have these little cards and we're just like, go find a piece of dirty laundry, but it can't be underwear and go run and we're timing them. And so we got them, you know, they're like, what else are we gonna do, Miss Carol? And so that's what's so exciting. And then I can, actually, I'm working a lot on hand, more handwriting now than I ever did in the clinic. So I think school-based OTs, um, if they're doing a lot more on handwriting, yeah, I think, I think this could move um, forward. But again, it's always gonna be based on engagement. And that, it's tough to do when you're on a screen. Um, and we're fortunate enough that we've already developed those relationships with the children, but we're always conscious of the fact that I need a buy-in. And having that engagement to go back and forth really is uh, amazing. But I think that's where you're gonna get stuck as a speech language pathologist and as an OT, school-based OT, is if you don't have that engagement. And like I said before, I was a special education teacher and that was one of the things that I always knew from day one, if I didn't have a connection with that child, then everything else was surface. But once you get that buy-in, then oh my goodness, the world just opens up and the possibilities are endless. And, and I think that's what we need more from, um, the, you know, going on to telehealth, you definitely need to be engaging and over the top. And that's what we're doing. And I am so tired, but I, I'm happy. <laughs> I'm, I'm in a good situation. Um, I'm, I'm so thankful that I'm still here to be able to support the families because a week ago, many private clinics had no idea, are we still gonna be able to function? So within five days, me and a couple of other people here in Atlanta who own private clinics got together and we were gonna figure it out and we did. And so we do see that this is gonna be possibly part of the future, but I may lose my voice before then. <laughs> But thank you. That was a good question. Well, thank you so much. Have a great evening. Thank you. I would just like to quickly ask, and you don't have to answer this, but when you send information, if you have anything to do, um, resources for those with limited mobility would be awesome. Okay. All right. I'll, I'll be on, I will put that in the group chat as well. 
All right, thank you, ladies. Brenda, you're muted. Every time I'm muted and I'm talking <laughs> to myself, sorry, y'all. Um, we're going to go ahead and move on just because we've got to get to the next presenter. But if you guys have any questions for Carol, she's got her information there. Um, and I kind of knew this was going to happen. You guys are presenting such great information. We're going to get a lot of questions. So um, again, reach out to the people that you still have questions for, write them down, um, and then send them either to the person you want to speak to or to me and Melissa, and we'll get them to whoever you, want, you need to get it to. Um, so our next presenter is going to be Shelby uh, DePia, and she's one of our BCBAs. Okay. Hi there. So my name is Shelby DePilla. Um, I'm a BCBA and I actually live in the enterprise area and own a clinic in Ozark, Alabama. Um, and then I do a lot of um, volunteer work as well. So if anyone's in my neck of the woods and needs some resources, feel free to reach out. Um, but I wanted to talk a little bit about ABA because that's um, my day job. <laughs> um, so basically, I know that some people have heard bad things about ABA um, and a lot of people who are just now starting to navigate what ABA is are unsure. So I just wanted to clear up some things. Um, in my clinic and in my experience, I work predominantly with children with autism spectrum disorder. That's not to say that's all that ABA you know, can help with or the only disorder, but that's pretty much what insurance will cover. So. Like I said, most of the time I'm interacting with um, children and young adults with autism. Um, so ABA is an evidence-based treatment. So it's based all on data and on the individual, which is one reason I fell in love with the field. Um, I wasn't sure if I was going to be a teacher when I was you know, in undergrad and I liked how ABA was all individual. And it works in all different environments. So my goal in ABA is always to work myself out of a job and make sure that the individual and the family I'm working with feels confident enough to be able to be part of the community and engage in whatever settings they need to without assistance. Um, in ABA, what we always look at is what behaviors do we need to decrease? And so this could be things that are impeding quality of life. And then we look at what skills do we need to teach or where are their deficits. Um, so ABA first began as behavior modification um, and it was seen, I mean nowadays it's seen very negatively. Um, much like other fields we have evolved since then. Um, so I wanted to kind of point out some of the positives of ABA for now, um, the things we do now. So today in the clinic, because um, we still are open right now, um, but we do have health screening that we're having to do and questionnaires and everything before clients come in. But we had a new client in today, and for his session today, all he did is pair. So what pairing is, is when a child comes and they're getting used to being an ABA, they're getting used to all these new strangers, um, including technicians or other children they may see there, and we're making sure that they see it as a positive experience. Um, I think one of the complaints that some adults who went through ABA and are, have autism was that it was negative, they were forced to do these things, so ABA has now moved beyond that. Um, we work now on making sure that there's consent, making sure that we allow autonomy and um, control of their own bodies to be expressed. So pairing is kind of part of that because we're teaching that this is a safe space, you can interact with us, we're going to have fun. Um, and with pairing, that's when we do lots of positive reinforcement. It's when the technician kind of works to see what does the child enjoy doing. Today we found out our new client really loves bubbles. So we're always going to make sure we have bubbles on hand to work with him. Um, and it usually lasts one to two weeks at the beginning of therapy. Um, and like I said, consent is something that is very important. Um, we always make sure that our clients have choices throughout the session. Um, we use least to most prompting. Traditionally in the past, a lot of times it was forced compliance by using a lot of hand over hand. Um, that's never the goal for us um, because then they're not really demonstrating that skill independently, which I'm sure a lot of you work in schools um, can understand that that's a problem as well. 
Um, and then another thing is the client dignity. So we focus on having, making sure that, you know, the children are learning to shut the door to the bathroom. Um, another part is we don't broadcast if we're in the community working on things that these individuals have autism or that they're seeking therapy. Um, they get to kind of, in, they're invited into part of the therapy and we, as age appropriate, we always let the children kind of um, state their own choices as well as have a choice like when we're making goals. Um, so I have clients from ages two all the way up to 18 currently. And so a lot of my older clients, um, they play part in making their plans. Um, they get to tell us what behaviors do they need help with? What kind of management would work for them? So that kind of all goes into the changes to ABA that's come up. Um, one of the things I'm very passionate about when it comes to working in ABA is the community involvement piece. Um, at my clinic, we take frequent field trips. So that's something that we've all adjusted to within recent weeks because we've had to stop that. Um, but even in the clinic, we use social modeling and role play so that the um, clients that we're working with, they're able to go to the grocery store, they're able to fill out job applications and know what behaviors are expected if they are getting the job. And so that's kind of something that is really important to me because I feel like we can teach a lot of these academic skills, but without doing the background so that they can interact with the community and have jobs and be able to be self-sufficient, um, that's going to be, that's, that's a missing piece. Um, sorry, my kids are still awake. <laughs> um, Another big piece in ABA is the caregiver and parent training. So what I found to be really effective is I have parents who schedule their training while their child's in therapy, and that way they can view how their RBT is interacting with their child. And then I, each parent also gets their own um, parent training handbook. Now, most insurances um, already have that parent training built in. So um, that should be part of your ABA and that should be helping you to be confident. And it's really important because of course, right now we have had to decrease some hours or if any of um, the clients are showing symptoms of being sick, I've had to move to more telehealth. So the parent training is really proven valuable because now I can say, okay, remember when we talked about how to run this program or remember when we talked about this and I can walk through the parent, I can walk the parent through doing that without, um, and so it just come, it kind of provides something to fall back on for when if the technician's not available or if the client can't come in. Um, and it helps the parent because now you're involved, you get to have your say. Um, you know, it's, um, it's a team approach rather than me, the practitioner, just telling the parents, okay, this is what we're going to do. Um, also, a big concern about ABA is punishment procedures. So, I have never to this day written a punishment procedure to be used in ABA. Um, I mean, really our ethics say it should only be used um, in case of severe injury or harm to other people. Um, now, there may be things like response costs. So if we tell a child, okay, you, you have to do this and then we can go get ice cream or then we can earn something fun. Um, and it's not a punishment because then you're reinforcing them. But um, I know a big concern is things like um, shocks or putting a child in a self-contained solo environment. Those are not what happens in ABA. If it does happen, it's unethical and should not be happening. Um, like I said earlier, the goal in ABA is always to be able to fade out. Um, all of my plans have transition plans for once we master this, we're going to decrease hours. Um, that's another reason the parent training is so important is because we're teaching the parents and the caregivers what to do. And then we're also communicating out with the client. Now, of course, that's based on developmental level and age, but we're still trying to teach the client, like this is what we're trying to move towards. Um, and also as far as ABA goes, we're always willing to collaborate with other therapy providers. Um, 
always willing to work together for whatever the families may need. Um, let's see. So, and then I do have some additional resources. Um, I run a Facebook page, the Enterprise Autism Group. I've been posting lots of different things on there. Um, we usually do a lot of different social events, which unfortunately right now are being postponed, but I am hoping to be able to continue to do some virtual meetings and talk about things there. Um, but like I said, I was contacted about talking about ABA and I thought maybe clearing up some of the things that I know go around online or that parents may find when they're first researching it might be good. Um, but does anyone have any questions? Aside from um, autism, what other um, diagnoses would a person or would a parent consider using ABA therapy for? So ABA is something that's universal because we're, it's based on using reinforcement to increase a behavior. Um, and so you kind of, I think of it this way, um, well, if you're blessed enough to love your work, that's awesome. But the main reason we all go to a job is for a paycheck, which that's positive reinforcement. Um, so ABA works for everybody. A lot of my student analysts joke about how they're ABAing their husbands or their boyfriends to get them to help around the house. Um, so by understanding the principles of behavior, you can really have more cooperation um, between two individuals. And under my resources page, there is actually a free RBT course, which goes through the basics of behavior and ABA, and that's for um, anyone from parents who want to learn more. Also, if anyone's interested in working the field, that's the first step to get into the field. Um, but in many other states, ABA is covered through like um, through Medicaid or other insurances for intellectual disabilities. Um, ADHD is kind of a new one that they're really talking seriously about because we've been doing a lot of research in the universities. Um, but if you were to go on an academic research papers, you probably find ABA in practically any um, developmental disability. Um, you would probably find a study about how ABA was applied. Um, I guess it comes back to the funding sources though. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Have a great evening. Thank you so much, Shelby. Does anyone have any other questions? If not, we're going to go ahead and go on to our next presenter, which is Kelly Cadden, and she will be speaking um, about language as well. Kelly, are you around? I am. I am. Thank you so much, guys. Guys, this has been really, really informative. Um, I, my name is Kelly Cadden. I am a speech language pathologist. I co-own All for Children, which is a uh, speech and literacy occupational and physical therapy clinic. Um, but I also contract with some schools. Um, Throughout, um, you'll see kind of on my slide, I have a love and a passion for AAC. So AAC is for students um, that need uh, either an alternative or an augmentative communication system to just help them communicate. Um, and so that's uh, my passion. I also get the privilege of working with uh, some students that have dyslexia at the clinic. I do a lot with that and uh, I do assistive technology um, as well. So I kind of uh, run kind of the spectrum. Um, but so that's why you'll see some of my slides are kind of more or information is more geared towards AAC. And so maybe some of those speech um, students or kids that you may have that are a little bit more complex communication needs. Um, I have gotten the privilege of trying telehealth um, for the past week and um, as an assistive technology person my whole clinic is like come on Kelly help us out and I always like to point out I'm not IT I'm, um, I don't know the, a ton about technology in general but I'm gonna figure it out I'm gonna figure out what is the best way um, to allow us or students to have access to what they need to have access to. Um, and so again, first is that we all have a right to communicate. And so that's why um, the technology kind of started in that realm. But I want to um, just kind of give a little bit because I have a strong feeling 
um, and this is not from, I have not gotten any official notice, but that we might all be looking more towards this digital learning. And um, from having a little bit of telehealth the past week, um, I just wanna say and encourage everybody to please give grace, like give strong grace, um, because I have the privilege um, with all the kids I'm working with now and getting to know those students um, kind of in a place I would say that's really um, comfortable for both of us and have access to lots of fun toys. I promise when I go into a room, everybody wants to come see speech because we want to encourage kids to communicate. So we bring some fun stuff with us. And so when we're at homes and I'm talking to families about what are some toys or activities you might have on hand, um, sometimes the parents are um, a little stumped or that they don't have all the fun things. Like we don't have the cool pop-up toy that you have. And so I just want to say that there is going to be some time where for me specifically, the SLP is going to have to figure out what is available in that home environment and how um, that child is going to interact with their parent in the room. Um, I think that my own personal child, um, he has dyslexia, and so he's doing telehealth with another coworker of mine, and I sit in the corner, and I'm like, say yes, ma'am. Say, you know, stop acting like that, you know, and I mean, kids just act so differently when a parent is looking on, and my expectations are what I have expected of that child and know when to push and when to pull back, when to reinforce might be very, very different than what is happening at home. And so um, I just want to kind of give that little bit of a caveat. Please give grace to all of the um, people you might be interacting because it is different for everybody involved, everybody involved. And it might just take a little bit of a learning curve um, for everybody. I will also say, um, that some of my AAC users, I was a little bit nervous about how this telehealth thing would work. Um, and it has been, I mean, just blown my mind about having, for me, um, a parent usually is sitting there with that student um, and the parents go, wow, I know this device a lot better now that I'm sitting there during their session and I'm modeling on my own device um, and like, hey, mom, that word is going to be under the adjective folder that's in the bottom row. And so the parents, I feel um, the feedback I'm getting is that they feel really more empowered now um, because they get to actually sit there with that student's um, device and see exactly what I'm expecting of them. Um, and so that's been really, really cool for a family or a parent or a dad to see, oh, this is what you mean when you tell me you want them to talk in one more extra word or when you want them to add on um, or follow these specific directions. Um, no matter the, the training or the parent sitting in the corner of my room during a normal session, um, can't imagine them when they get kind of hands on with that child and I'm kind of facilitating that learning piece. Um, I also want to say, um, and I promise I'll get to kind of some other tips, but um, so again, like I said, my own child has dyslexia and I work with kids with dyslexia. I promise I make it fun and the students I work with enjoy me. And so I've been like, okay, we're going to do reading every morning and I'm bringing out my Play-Doh. I'm bringing out all my fun things with my own child. And he has broken down in tears working with me. Um, and I, I, I had a wise coworker of mine tell me, you know, Kelly, you're his mom, and um, he doesn't want to fail in front of you. And so be mindful of that, that when you kind of, if you're taking on a lot of um, that education role, your student is probably, your child is probably going to act differently. And um, there are moments when I have to take a step back and go, you know what, I want my child to know that I love him and that he is amazing, and he is wonderful at so many things that God has blessed him with, and right now we're just not going to work on that, um, and we're going to find another time in our day that I might sneak in some reading or some spelling for him specifically, and so to carry that over into communication, lucky us, we communicate all day long. Um, we just might have different expectations and different activities and different moments of our day. If you've got um, Four kids in your household, um, maybe don't pick the battle right then to um, during when you're trying to get lunch on the table for everybody to force your child to communicate something. That might just not be the best time, but model, model, model communication and language because um, that is the best thing. I think um, Marcy and I'm sure other people have said 
talk while you're doing things. Um, if you've got a verbal communicator, um, that is the best thing. And talk at their level or one word above. And so while you're making breakfast, oh, I'm opening uh, the microwave or opening the toaster, put it on the pan, wash, wash, wash my hands, talk all the time, and just make that a language-rich environment for, for your kiddos. Um, so for my AAC users, I love to encourage families to have as many pictures around as they can um, and to not be afraid to get on your student's device at times and go, oh, that smells bad. Or this morning I burned the biscuits. Oh, yucky. Throw away. Put in the trash can. And I was like, can I look? Um, and so they find, most of my kiddos find it so fun for their parent to be communicating using the um, AAC device that they use. And um, our students who use AAC devices, it's really, really hard for them to learn how to use them if nobody is modeling them. We model all day long verbal speech. And so we have to model on our students' um, devices for us to expect them to be able to use them. So kind of one of my um, first things is that I, I strongly encourage you to look to see what your students or your child's goals are and see if AAC or communication supports are listed and do you have those at home. Um, I know in certain areas they might be at school still and um, so I would reach out and figure out what's going on and for that. I want personally, I want my students to communicate wherever um, they may be and so trying to figure out what they've been using to communicate at school and talking to the team and talking about that coming home. Um, there also might be listed high-tech devices or low-tech devices and so discuss what's best for maybe your family um, and what's best for your child in this kind of new environment and then talk to the team about getting that option. Um, if it does come home, make sure you have on a sticky note or on an email any passcodes they might use um, to either, either edit device, to even open the device. Um, I hope that they've somehow found a way to make a backup of the device because I've had plenty of devices um, get have some issues at home, whether they fall into water or different things. And so having a backup of their communication layout somewhere is really helpful so we can quickly um, make a new page set on, on a device or another device. Um, so there's also something called guided access, which is on a lot of iPads, or it's on all, almost all iPads, unless you have a first generation. So that means if you triple click the home screen, they lock them in to that um, either app or that communication um, app. And so that might mean you as a parent might be home one day and you might actually triple click the home button or a sibling or the student when they're modeling or using it. Um, and so you need to know that passcode to be able to get out of guided access. And I'd be happy to kind of share more information about guided access, but you need to know that password to be able to get out of that app if it's not the communication app. Um, I kind of skipped um, how's your school providing services because I think it is so unknown right now. And I think people have mentioned it but just know that the services are, are going to probably look a little different. Again, I have no idea, but I, um, you know, some of the groups I've had, I don't know how I would do that, that style of therapy um, in this type of platform. Um, and so just be aware of that. And some of my students that are more speech kiddos, like speech sounds, um, their style of um, in this type of format will be very different than some of my students that have a little bit more complex needs that um, that I might need to have a little bit more one-on-one -on -one or the parent or a different time of day or smaller bursts of therapy um, as opposed to kind of a 30-minute chunk of time. So those are just some things to, um, to talk to your team about. I, I've been a part of a lot of teams and I luckily have never been a part of a team that the parents or excuse me the educators went ah, we don't really care every every team I've been a part of cares so much for these kids and anybody I'm talking with now is aching I promise I want to be back at school and see these kids um, I'm, I'm a feeler so like I want to give them a side hug really bad and so through technology I'm doing the best I can you can already see I talk with my hands but it's just nothing how it is in real life so know that we are aching um, 
if I don't know if I could say we're aching more than the parents, but um, but that it, it is hard on us too. So we all want best. Um, but at, at this current moment, we're just not getting a whole lot of exactly what we're supposed to be doing. And I hope that that's going to change soon for us so we can better plan and provide support um, and, and that it's, it's for y'all as well. So a few things is that just to realize that we all communicate in different, different ways uh, in different environments. And so y'all at home, I don't know about y'all, but I don't talk in these. Well, I do because I'm an SLP, but I don't. My kids might not have to talk in perfectly grammatically correct six to seven word sentences to just comment or ask a question, but in speech therapy we do. So um, trying to decide that in the home environment, what, what kind of times of day are we going to expect and um, is an eye roll appropriate or is it a point appropriate, nonverbal communication, what are we going to have work on for the for our child and what are we going to expect in this home environment and then let's take it one step up um, also look at the goals on your students IEP or if you've got private therapy and figure out how, how are those goals going to work in our home environment and ask for some support or ideas um, working on WH questions using informational text might not be the most exciting goal to work on um, at home but you can work on WH questions in um, a variety of other ways all throughout your day. Um, but we communicate to request for things, to express feelings, to ask or answer questions, to tell people about things, to protest, to give opinions, to ask for help. So make sure you're encouraging all those different ways um, and not just working on yes, no questions or not just working on requesting. Try and see how you can encourage your child to communicate all those things or at the very least you model all those things the milk spills. And so instead of just getting a towel, wiping it up, you go, oh, sticky, wet. Oh, I made a mess. I'm going to clean it up. I don't have a towel. And so do you have a towel? So talk through everything that you're doing. Um, and, and I think that that will really, really encourage some of the communication while y'all are at home. Um, and just to know, I, I personally would have a hard time working on 10 different goals. And so just picking an activity that works best for you and your, and your child in that current moment. Um, and knowing, at least this is what I'm, I'm kind of holding on to, my child will, my child will go back to school personally, um, and my child will make, make progress. Um, I'm hoping uh, that it, the, the lacks of time will not be huge benefit and I have to trust that it won't be, um, that he will catch up, we will work through these things, um, but it's just really hard in the trenches right now to know that we're missing out on, on some support, um, but that I, I, I just know and have to have faith that um, however many weeks or months we're at home, that it will be recouped. We, we will get it back. And right now I'm just going to choose to to pick my battles and to work on the things that I can have control over and that I can do the best that I can do and have to kind of let, let go some of the things that I can't. Um, so again, make it as fun as you can and as functional. I love putting clothes on the wrong body parts and having students be like, what is she doing? When I have a shoe on my head. Um, and so just make it fun and silly. Um, try and focus on their level and things that they enjoy. Um, I've heard people say Legos or um, in swings. Um, if I brought out a, um, a car for every single kid I worked with, that would be really boring. And so find things that that child loves and wants to kind of hook onto because I promise that's going to make them communicate. Um, so I think, um, I'm trying to just jump all over the place, but if there's any questions you'll have about communication at home, I'd be happy to answer. Thank you so much, Kelly. And if you had one thing to tell parents that would give them a positive and not have them so anxious, what would it be? Um, I think my biggest thing is that um, just really focus on the student or your child and how 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 can your child communicate better at home and just focus on that i get the privilege of working at schools and at the clinic and i have to do my school goals and then i get to do my clinic goals and i love getting to just say okay what is what's make what's a challenge at home right now and let's work on communicating that is it asking for help is it 
um, being able to answer just when they're hurting and let's work on that. And so I would just encourage to use this time to pick one thing that could really impact your family at home and stick with that in fun, um, functional ways that you've already got around the house that the, that, um, that your child is used to. Perfect. Thanks so much, Kelly. We appreciate you. Thank you. And if no one else has any other questions, we're going to run right into Diane Sessa and she's going to do her presentation. So I will let her introduce herself and tell you guys what she's going to talk about. Diana, I think you're muted. I bet you this is a lot better, huh? <laughs> Sorry, anybody lip reading? You know, with um, the online work that we do, um, you speech pathologists will understand what I'm saying when we're working with our students, we're used to seeing what their lips are doing, right? <laughs> So I'm, I'm working on my internet speed to avoid that lag because of how much that, how important that is. All right, sorry, I digress. I'm Diana Cessna. I'm an NILD educational therapist. Um, we're professionally certified by the National Institute of Learning Development. Um, my other certifications are specialties in dyslexia education, literacy, and my graduate degree is in. Um, exceptional student education. Oh wow, there's a little bit. Um, <laughs> thank you for popping that up. So there's just a little bit more about me, but that's not the important part. The important part is the kids. So um, there's just a few things that I, I want to just bring up today to tell you a little bit more about what I do. Educational therapy um, uh, is prescriptive and diagnostic with individual children on, in one-on-one -on -one therapy or in small group therapy. So we work very diagnostically with, you know, a lot of the, the tests that you are familiar with and a lot of um, progress monitoring to make sure that we tailor techniques to a child's needs, whether they're in the autism spectrum, dealing with ADHD, dyslexia, or dysgraphia, um, or anything across the spectrum. We um, have an NI, uh, a certified NILD teletherapy training, and in the in our NILD teletherapy training platform, um, we have specifically designed techniques that we pull from our in-person training and um, uh, adjust them to be able to work online interactively. And that that platform we've been using now for about for almost ten years. I myself have been using the platform for two years about um, through you know a lot of training and a lot of practicing it. Now I'm doing it full time like many of you are. All of a sudden full time online educators. Um, so the most important thing I wanna say, I know a lot of people have covered some details about assistive technology. Some people have covered you know, some details about you know, dyslexia and other learning differences. So I just wanna highlight a few things that are really important to, um, in, uh, really important messages to get out. All of us are working with families and students across the country. And I think one very important message that I'm trying to get out there that I'm working on is internet security. A lot of students, a lot of parents and families are on the internet and are using platforms, new platforms that they haven't used before and certainly not in, you know, the, the amount of time they're using it a lot more than they ever have before. So I implore you to work with all your students and your families to go over some internet security. Uh, whatever platform, you know, they're using, who they're who is on that platform, who they're chatting with. And, and, and they, they vary, everything from Zoom to Google Classroom to Facebook Live to YouTube even. Now, you, you know, YouTube's a platform that, you know, is, um, does, isn't out, a lot of these platforms are not private. Actually, one of the things I teach in, in AT or internet security is that there is absolutely no privacy on the internet, no matter where you are on the internet. So anybody can come in and, um, and you know, and and puts your you know child or parents at risk by pretending they're someone else or 
trying to get information in various different ways. I'm working on a very detailed presentation about that to put some helpful tips up there. But as you know, educators, I'm sure you've been through some type of online training and um, using assistive technology. A lot of the programs we use do give us some of, that, some of that compliance and ethics training. I implore each of you to look at your training on that and share some of those very helpful, important tips with, with parents. So internet security is something that, um, obviously this isn't the platform to, to um, talk about all, all the um, things that we should be aware of. Just uh, I just want to share that awareness, implore you to look into more of that and um, share that with your family. Um, our assisted, the assisted technology that our students use does vary. It depends on, you know, what their needs are. And just in the dyslexia, dysgraphia space, you know, one of the biggest things we encourage is ear reading, right? We know that ear reading is just, it activates the same areas of the brain as eye reading does. And with a lot of families um, at home with their kids, uh, it might get frustrating for the for the children and the students to read independently. Uh, their parents may not, um, because they're in school all the time, may not be aware of how much of a struggle it is for some of our kids to read independently or to understand what they read when they're eye reading. And looking for you know bad habits like guessing, guessing at words by pictures, guessing at you know words using a three cueing system or anything like that. If your children are coming home and reading, you know, with those bad habits, they might find reading very frustrating on their own. So I, again, encourage parents to read to their children, or if that's absolutely not possible, allow their children to use Audible programs. We've ta I've heard mention of a few Audible reading programs. The one I particularly uh, like the most is Learning Ally. LearningAlly.org has some, has, uh, offer has been offering free services and scholarships for families to access the platform. A lot of school districts offer it as a, as a, a, through grants um, to anybody on an IEP. You do have to be certified with a language-based learning um, difference to um, be able to access the program. So textbooks, uh, abundant literature, a lot of many of the many of the um, re uh, books and textbooks on there also have um, written content that's highlighted as it's being read in real voices. Some really wonderful um, real real people are reading reading on learning allies. So that's one of the reasons I like it. Another reason I like it is it gives you links and ideas to other literacy resources for writing um, and um, for using other multi-sensory techniques. Um, but the most important thing to know is that accommodations are not modifications. If, um, if uh, content has to be modified, that's different. If, if a, a, a ear reading is an accommodation and, and that kind of accommodation is something that is helping um, a student keep up with age level content, keep up with their peers, be able to really expose themselves to the kind of reading that interests them and it helps build background knowledge, vocabulary, gives them exposure to different syntax and figurative language that um, they don't have access to if they are only reading a leveled reading or if they're only reading you know, books that they think are at, that, at their level. So for, for you know, everything I say and I train about dyslexia really applies to all students and any student. Um, uh, not limiting the student whatever struggles they have to a certain level of reading, but really do that above level reading with them. Let them hear different language, let them hear different back, different um, uh, content to expand their, their background knowledge. Um, and that's one of the reasons why ear reading you know, is so important. Dysgraphia is something that a lot of parents might see for the first time at home too. If they, if their their children are home with them working, and they may see them struggling with their written work. Uh, the most important thing I think I can say about dysgraphia um, in the limited time that we have is that dysgraphia is not just about handwriting. It's not just about the you know legible handwriting. Dyslexia, dysgraphia. 
um, has different forms. Actually, a, a child with dysgraphia that only struggles with handwriting is probably the easiest to remediate. But dysgraphia goes beyond that. Um, dysgraphia can be, you know, uh, uh, comorbid with sensory processing issues, executive functioning, and ADHD, where a child of, you know, you, uh, parents can get frustrated with a child that seems to know very much about a particular subject or a topic that they're working on, but then isn't able to write it down, and they're staring at a blank sink, see, sheet of paper. So, you know, I implore parents everywhere to understand that this is not a discipline problem. This is not a problem where the child is refusing to write. Um, uh, uh, it may seem like they, they know very much about the topic or the lesson that you're working on, but then, um, you know, obviously um, the responses that they're getting because of, you know, blocks they have in executive functioning, graphical motor skills, um, executive uh, or planning and um, organization are what's um, stopping them from being able to write. So just highlighting a couple of things to understand that some struggles, um, you know, some some struggles that, that may be evident when the child is home doing their schoolwork at home, um, they're, they're not discipline problems. You know, most children want to learn. Most children are very eager to learn. And some of the th these things show up because they're on a spectrum of dyslexia or dysgraphia comorbid ADHD or many of the other things that a lot of my other colleagues here have talked about already. Um, and to, you know, to, to keep up with the brevity of, of wrapping up this presentation, one last thing I want to say is that, um, you know, parents, parents and teachers are, are very different. Um, I am a trained educator. I've, you know, got you know, some, uh, a lot of credentials I can put on the paper over here that you see on the screen. Guess who doesn't care one bit about any of my credentials? <laughs> my son, <laughs> right? Anybody that teaches, and well, I, he's, I, say, I say that jokingly, but anyone that teaches their child knows what I'm talking about, right? Um, you as a professional educator can be very effective with your students in the classroom or one-on-one. -on -one. When you're teaching your own child, it is a very, very different thing. So I, you know, I want to tell all parents out there, even us well-trained professional educators um, are not, you know, the, you know are, are, are not very effective with our own children if we teach them the same way we teach other children. We have to teach our children as moms. So all these new um, parent educators in training or parent educators in crisis at home, um, that are working with their student with their with their children. Obviously, they're the mom. You know, mom, a mom and dad is the child's first teacher. It, you know, you are a teacher. You are teaching your child. You've always taught your child. Is what I want to say to any parent out there. You know your child best, and you do know how to teach your child. But if you try to teach your child as if you were a teacher, that doesn't work. That doesn't even work for teachers. <laughs> You have to teach, you have to make sure that you, you, you're, you are the mom to that, you, you remain the parent to that child and the child knows that they're safe and secure with you and you figure things out together. You figure things out together with love, with patience, um, with humor and excitement because if that's not happening, then nothing's going to work. So I wish everybody, you know, I wish everybody, um, you know, the best in uh, pouring into their children and enjoying this time that you have to get to know your children, uh, children's academic work more, uh, get to individualize their learning, get to make their learning fun, and, you know, really share things that will help you grow as much as they're growing through this experience. And look for God's blessings every day because, uh, you know, every day, you know, you can choose to focus on things that are beyond your control or you can focus on, you know, the the, the blessings and the good things that you see throughout the day. There are still very many wonder, wonderful things to focus on throughout the day. Thanks for letting me be part of this presentation. Um, I talked about NILD teletherapy uh, initially, so I'll put a link here in the chat where we have NILD educational therapists at actually nationwide and internationally. So I'll just post a link here to find a therapist on the NILD site. If you plug in your zip code, if you plug in your zip code, you can find a therapist and find a therapist that's trained 
in in the teletherapy platform. There, uh, we are um, nationwide. Thank you so much, Diane. Does everyone have any questions for Diane? That was just amazing. I, I didn't even know that that resource existed. So um, that was great information. Thank you. Thank you, and please reach out. Um, yeah, that was a brief and quick overview because I know that we all have lots and lots to do now. So thank you so much for help, uh, for allowing me to be part of this and connecting with all of you. And please reach out and, and uh, if um, I can be of any further resource to anybody. Diane, would you be so kind as to put your information that you want people to contact you in the chat um, so that they have that information, please? I think I will. I seem to be on the chat. Oh, there I am. <laughs> yes, I can. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you so much. Is there any other questions that you guys have for any of our presenters? Okay, well, that sounds like a no, so I'm hoping all of your questions were answered. And I appreciate each and every one of you coming out and in you know, spending time with us and doing this. And, our, and thank you so much to the presenters for taking time out of your day to do this as well. We appreciate each and every one of you. Um, and we hope to hear from you guys soon. Thank you so much and everyone have a great night. Thank you, everybody. Have a good night, guys. Good night. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. As soon as this gets um, transferred over to an MP3, I will uh, get it sent out to everybody. It'll probably be first thing in the morning because it takes a while. Awesome. That's fine. Thank, thank you, Brenda. Thank you, Melissa. This You're was welcome. a lot of good stuff in there. Thank you all. Thank you so much. You guys are so welcome. Have a wonderful night. Have a good night, y'all. Bye-bye. Thank you. Can't hang up. <laughs>